the trial of oscar wilde by anonymous section one preface it is wrong for us during the greater part of the time to handle these questions with timidity and false shame and to surround them with reticence and mystery matters relating to sexual life ought to be studied without the introduction of moral prepossessions or of preconceived ideas false shame is as hateful as frivolity it is a matter of pressing concern to rid ourselves of the old prejudice that we sully our pens by touching upon facts of this class it is necessary at all costs to put aside our moral aesthetic or religious personality to regard facts of this nature merely as natural phenomena with impartiality and a certain elevation of mind preface i blame equally as much those who take it upon themselves to praise man as those who make it their business to blame him together with others who think that he should be perpetually amused and only those can i approve who seek for truth with tear-filled eyes pascal in de profundis that harmonious and last expression of the perfect artist wilde seems in a single page to have concentrated in guise of supreme confession all the pain and passion that stirred and sobbed in his soul this new life as through my love of dante i like sometimes to call it is of course no new life at all but simply the continuance by means of development and evolution of my former life i remember when i was at oxford saying to one of my friends as we were strolling round maudlin's narrow bird haunted walks one morning in the year before i took my degree that i wanted to eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden of the world and that i was going out into the world with that passion in my soul and so indeed i went out and so i lived my only mistake was that i confined myself so exclusively to the trees of what seemed to me the sunlit side of the garden and shunned the other side for its shadow and its gloom failure disgrace poverty sorrow despair suffering tears even the broken words that come from lips in pain remorse that makes one walk on thorns conscience that condemns self-abasement that punishes the misery that puts ashes on its head the anguish that chooses sackcloth for its raiment and into its own drink puts gall all these were things of which i was afraid and as i had determined to know nothing of them i was forced to taste each of them in turn to feed on them to have for a season indeed no other food at all further on he tells us that his dominant desire was to seek refuge in the deepest shade of the garden for his mouth was full of the bitterness of the dead sea fruit that he had tasted adding that this tomb-like aroma was the befitting and necessary outcome of his preceding life of error. We are inclined to think he deceived himself. The day wherein he was at last compelled to face the horror of his tragical destiny, his soul was tried beyond endurance. He strode deliberately, as he himself assures us, towards the gloomiest nook of the garden, inwardly trembling perhaps but proud notwithstanding hoping against hope that the sun's rays would seek him out even there or in other words that he would not cease to live that bios theoreticos which he held to be the greatest ideal from the high tower of thought we can look out at the world calm and self-centred and complete the aesthetic critic contemplates life and no arrow drawn at a venture can pierce between the joints of his harness we all know what arrows struck him arrows that he himself had sharpened and that society had not forgotten to tip with poison Quote, neither his own heedlessness nor the envious and hypocritical anger of his enemies nor the snobbish cruelty of social reprobation were the true cause of his misfortunes it was he himself who after a time of horrible anguish consented to his punishment with a sort of supercilious disdain for the weakness of human will and out of a certain regard and unhealthy curiosity for the sportfulness of fate 
Here was a voluptuary seeking for torture and desiring pain after having wallowed in every sensual pleasure. Could such conduct have been due to aught else but sheer madness? Unquote. The true debauchee has no such object. He seeks only for pleasure and discounts beforehand the conditions that life dictates for the same. The conditions laid down containing no guarantee that the pleasure will be actually grasped except only in promise and anticipation. Later, too proud to acknowledge his cruel disappointment, he will gravely assure us that the bitterness left in the bottom of the goblet, whose wine he has quaffed, has indeed the sweet taste that he sought after. Certain minds are satisfied with the phantasmagoria of their intelligence, whereas the voluptuary finds happiness only in the pleasure of realisation. In his heart he concocts for himself a prodigious mixture of sorrow and of joy, of suffering and of ecstasy. But the great world, wotting naught of this secret alchemy, and judging only according to the facts which lie upon the surface, slices down to the same level with the same stupid knife, the strange beautiful flower, as well as the evil weed that grew apace. Remy de Gourmont said of the famous author Paul Adam that he was a magnificent spectacle. Wild may be pronounced a painful problem. He seems to escape literary criticism in order to fall under the keen scalping knife of the analytical moralist by the paradoxical fact of his apparently imperious purpose to hew out and fashion forth his life as a work of art. Save here and there, in intentions and in his poems, the poem of Reading Jail, nothing of his soul has he thrown into his books. He seemed to desire, one can almost postulate as a certainty, the stupendous tragedy that blasted his life. From the abyss where his flesh groaned in misery, his conscience hovered above him contemplating his woeful state, whilst he thus became the spectator of his own death throes. That is the reason why he stirs us so deeply. Those who might be tempted to search in his work for an echo, however feeble, of a new message to mankind, will be grievously disappointed. The technical cleverness of Wilde is undeniable, but the magnificent dress in which he has clothed it appears to us to have been borrowed. He has brought us neither remedy nor poison. He leads us nowhere, but at the same time we are conscious that he has been everywhere. No companion of ours is he, but all the companions we hold dear he has known. True, he sat at the feet of the wise men of Greece in the gardens of Academus, but the eurythmy of their jests fascinated him more than the soberness of their doctrines. Dante he followed in all his subterranean travels and peregrinations, but all that he has to relate to us after his frightful journeyings is merely an ecstatic description of the highly wrought scenery that he had witnessed. I packed all my genius, said he, into my life. I put only my talent into my works. Unfaithful to the principle which he learnedly deduced in intentions, v. that the undivided soul of a writer should incorporate itself in his work, even as Shakespeare pushing aside the impulses that stirred so strongly within him that he had, as it were, perforce, to suffer them to realise their energy, not on the lower plane of actual life, where they would have been trammelled and constrained and so made imperfect, but on that of the imaginative plane of art. He came to confound the intensity of feeling with the calmness of beauty. Possessed of a mind of rare culture, he nevertheless only evoked, when he touched art, harmonious vibrations, perhaps, but vibrations which others, after all said and done, had already created before him. He succeeded in producing nothing more than a splendid and incomparable echo. The most that can be said is that the music he had in his soul he kept there, living all the time a crowded, ostentatious life, and distinguishing himself as a superlative conversationalist. Be this as it may, posterity cannot judge us according to those possibilities of our nature which were never developed.
however numerous may be the testimonies in our favour she cannot pronounce excepting on the works or at least the materials left by the workmen it is this which renders so precarious the actor's fleeting glory as it likewise dissipates the golden halo that hovers over the brilliant society cassure nothing remains of malarme excepting a few cunningly wrought verses inferior to the clearer and more profound poems of his great master baudelaire of wilde nothing will remain beyond his written works which are vastly inferior to his brilliant epigrammatic conversation in our days the master of repartee and the after-dinner speaker is foredoomed to forgetfulness for he always stands alone and to gain applause has to talk down to and flatter lower class audiences no writer of blood-curdling melodramas no weaver of newspaper novels is obliged to lower his talent so much as the professional wit if the genius of mallarme was obscured by the flatterers that surrounded him how much more was wilde's talent overclouded by the would-be witty shoddy elegant and cheaply poetical society hangers-on who covered him with incense one of his devoted literary courtesans who has written a life of wilde which is nothing more than a rhapsodical panegyric of his intimacy with the poet tells us that the first attempts of the sparkling conversationalist were not at all successful in paris drawing-rooms in the house of victor hugo seeing he had to let the veteran sleep out his nap whilst others among the guests slumbered also he made up his mind to astonish them he succeeded but at what a cost although he was a verse writer most sincerely devoted to poetry and art and one of the most emotional and sensitive and tender-hearted amongst modern wielders of the pen he succeeded only in gaining a reputation for artificiality we all know his studied paradoxes his five or six continually repeated tales but we are tempted to forget the charming dreamer who was full of tenderness for everything in nature it is true that Mallarmé has not written much but all he has done is valuable some of his verses are most beautiful whilst wilde seem never to finish anything the works of the english aesthete are very interesting because they characterize his epic his pages are useful from a documentary point of view but are not extraordinary from a literary standpoint in the duchess of padua he imitates hugo and sardot the picture of dorian gray was inspired by Wismont. Intentions is a vademecum of symbolism, and all the ideas contained therein are to be found in Mallarmé and Villiers de la Ladome. As for Wilde's poetry, it closely follows the lines laid down by Swinburne. His most original composition is poems in prose. They give a correct idea of his home chat, but not when he was at his best. That, no doubt, is because the art of talking must always be inferior to any form of literary composition thoughts properly set forth in print after due correction must always be more charming than a finely sketched idea hurriedly enunciated when conversing with a few disciples in ordinary table talk we meet nothing more than ghosts of newborn ideas foredoomed to perish the jokes of a wit seldom survive the speaker when we quote the epigrams of wilde it is as if we were exhibiting in a glass case a collection of beautiful butterflies whose wings have lost the brilliancy of their once gaudy colours lively talk pleases because of the man who utters it and we are impressed also by the gestures which accompany his frothy discourse what remains of the sprightly quips and anecdotes of such celebrated hommes d'esprit as Scholl, beck and barbet d'auvelli some stories of the eighteenth century have been transmitted to us by chamfort but only because he carefully remodelled them by the aid of his clever pen these opinions of rebel questionable though they may be show us plainly something of the charm and the weakness of wilde a perfect artist desiring to leave his mark on the temple columns of fame must not live among his fellow men ambitious to taste the bitterness and the sweetness alike of every caress of existence but submit himself pitilessly to the thraldom of the writing-desk 
some authors may produce masterpieces amidst the busy throng but there are others who lose all power of creation unless they shut themselves up for a time and live severely by rote when wilde was dragging out a wretched life in the sordid room of a cheap furnished hotel where he eventually died did he ever remember while reading balzac by the flickering light of his one candle that the great master of french literature often sought solitude and wrestled for eighteen hours at a stretch with the demon of severe toil did he ever repeat the doleful wail of the author of la comedie humaine who was sometimes heard to exclaim in sad tones i ought not to have done that i ought to have put black on white black on white few experiments are really necessary for the literary creator who seeks to analyse the stuff of which life is composed in order to dissolve for us all its elements and demonstrate its ever-present underlying essence the romance writer must stand away from the crowd if only for a time and reflect deeply upon what he has seen and heard the power of thought to be free and fruitful cannot flourish without the strength of ascetism we must yield to that law which decrees that action may not be the twin sister of dreams those who live a life of pleasure can only give us colourless falsehoods when they try to depict sincerity of feeling the confessions of sensualists resemble volcanic ashes wilde himself gives us the key to his errors and his weakness human life is the one thing worth investigating compared to it there is nothing else of any value it is true that as one watches life in its curious crucible of pain and pleasure one cannot wear over one's face a mask of glass nor keep the sulphurous fumes from troubling the brain and making the imagination turbid with monstrous fancies and misshapen dreams there are poisons so subtle that to know their properties one has to sicken of them there are maladies so strange that one has to pass through them if one seeks to understand their nature and yet what a great reward one receives how wonderful the whole world becomes to one to note the curious hard logic of passion and the emotional coloured life of the intellect to observe where they meet and where they separate at what point they are in unison and at what point they are in discord there is a delight in that what matter what the cost is one can never pay too high a price for any sensation the brain becomes dulled at this sport which it would be illusory to call a study he who uses his intellect to serve only his sensuality can produce nothing elaborate but what is artificial such is the dilemma of wilde whose collections of writings is like a painted stage scene mere garish canvas behind which there is never anything substantial when i first saw wilde he had not yet been seared by the brand of general reprobation often i changed my opinion of him but at first I felt the enthusiasm which young literary aspirants always feel for those who have made their mark. Then the lawsuit took place, followed by the dramatic thunderclap of a criminal prosecution, and my soul revolted, as if some great iniquity had been consummated. Later on it seemed to me that the man of fashion had swallowed up the literary god. His baggage seemed light, and his brilliant butterfly life had perhaps been of more importance to him than the small pile of volumes bearing his name. Today I seem clearly to understand what sort of a man he was. Extraordinary beyond a doubt, but never has artificial sentiment been so cunningly mingled with seemingly natural simplicity and pulsating pleasure in one and the same man. I must say to myself that I ruined myself and that nobody great or small can be ruined except by his own hand. I am quite ready to say so. I am trying to say so, though they may not think it at the present moment. This pitiless indictment I bring without pity against myself. Terrible as was what the world did to me, what I did to myself was far more terrible still. I was a man who stood in symbolic relations to the art and culture of my age. 
I had realized this for myself at the very dawn of my manhood, and had forced my age to realize it afterwards. Few men hold such a position in their own lifetime, and have it so acknowledged. It is usually discerned, if discerned at all, by the historian or the critic, long after both the man and his age have passed away. With me it was different. I felt it myself, and made others feel it. Byron was a symbolic figure, but his relations were the passion of his age and its weariness of passion. Mine were to something more noble, more permanent, of more vital issue, of larger scope. The gods had given me almost everything, but I let myself be lured into long spells of senseless and sensual ease. I amused myself with being a flaneur, a dandy, a man of fashion. I surrounded myself with the smaller natures and the meaner minds. I became the spendthrift of my own genius, and to waste an eternal youth gave me a curious joy. Tired of being on the heights, I deliberately went to the depths in the search for new sensation. What the paradox was to me in the sphere of thought, perversity became to me in the sphere of passion. Desire, at the end, was a malady, or a madness, or both. I grew careless of the lives of others. I took pleasure where it pleased me, and passed on. I forgot that every little action of the common day makes or unmakes character, and that therefore what one has done in the secret chamber one has some day to cry aloud on the housetop. I ceased to be lord over myself. I was no longer the captain of my soul, and did not know it. I allowed pleasure to dominate me. I ended in horrible disgrace. There is only one thing for me now absolute humility this confession of irreparable defeat while being exceedingly dolorous is unfortunately rendered still further painful by other pages which contradict it and almost tempt us to doubt its sincerity in spite of the fact that wilde was always sincere for those who knew how to read between the lines and enter into his spirit there is no doubt that he was truly a most extraordinary man endowed by striking originality. But a man who at the same time took more than uncommon care to hide his gifts under a cloak bought in some conventional bazaar which made a point of keeping abreast with the fashions of the day. What brought about his downfall was the mad idea that possessed him of the possibility of employing in the service of noble aspirations all, without exception, all the passions that moved and agitated his human soul, Every one of us is, no doubt, peopled at times with mysterious spirits, ephemeral apparitions, which, like the wild beasts that Christ long ago cast out of the Gadarene swine, tear themselves to pieces in internecine warfare. It is with such soldiers as these, who very seldom obey the superior orders of the higher intellect, or desert and rebel against us at the opportune moment, that we are called upon to withstand the onslaught of a thousand enemies. Wilde made the grand mistake of trying to understand them all. He believed that they were capable of adapting themselves to that powerful instinct which animated him, and which directed him, wherever he wandered or wherever he went, towards the spirit of beauty. This error lasted long enough, perhaps, to convince him of the power that was born in him, but Unfortunately, the revelation of his error came too late. End of section one. Section two. My object in this preface is not to write the life of Wilde. I have only to do with the writer, for the man is yet too much alive, and his wounds have scarcely ceased bleeding. In the presence of still living sorrow, crimson tinged, Respect commands us to stand bareheaded. Before the scarred face of woe the voice is dumb. We should, above all, endeavour rather to ignore the accidents that thrust themselves into a life, and try to discover the great, calm soul, beautiful in its melancholy, which, though pained and suffering, 
has never ceased to be nobly inspired. To prove that this was true in the case of Wilde, we may have recourse to some of those who knew him well and who form a great cloud of witnesses, testifying to the veracity of the things we have laid down. Mr. Arthur Simmons, a keen and large-minded critic, a friend of Wilde's, and an elegant and forcible writer to boot, in his recent volume Studies in Prose and Verse, characterises Wilde as a poet of attitudes, and we cannot do better than quote a few lines from the fine article which he consecrated to our author. When the ballad of reading Gowl was published, he said, it seemed to some people that such a return to, or so startling a first acquaintance with real things, was precisely what was most required to bring into relation, both with life and art, an extraordinary talent so little in relation with matters of common experience, so fantastically alone in a region of intellectual abstractions. In this poem, where a style formed on other lines seems startled at finding itself used for such new purposes, we see a great spectacular intellect, to which, at least, pity and terror have come in their own person, and no longer as puppets in a play. In its sight, human life has always been something acted on the stage, a comedy, in which it is the wise man's part to sit aside and laugh, but in which he may also disdainfully take part, as in a carnival, under any mask. The unbiased, scornful intellect to which humanity has never been a burden comes now to be unable to sit aside and laugh, and it has worn and looked behind so many masks that there is nothing left desirable in illusion. Having seen, as the artist sees, further than morality, but with so partial an eyesight as to have overlooked it on the way, it has come at length to discover morality in the only way left possible for itself. And, like most of those who, having thought themselves weary, have made the adventure of putting thought into action, it has had to discover it sorrowfully, at its own incalculable expense. And now, having become so newly acquainted with what is pitiful and what seems most unjust, in the arrangement of human affairs, it has gone, not unnaturally, to an extreme, and taken, on the one hand, humanitarianism, on the other, realism, at more than their just valuation in matters of art. It is that odd instinct of the intellect, the necessity of carrying things to their farthest point of development, to be more logical than either life or art, to very wayward and illogical things, in which conclusions do not always follow from premises. His intellect was dramatic, and the whole man was not so much a personality as an attitude, and it was precisely in his attitudes that he was most sincere. They represented his intentions. They stood for the better, unrealized part of himself. Thus, his attitude towards life and towards art was untouched by his conduct. His perfectly just and essentially dignified assertion of the artist's place in the world of thought and the place of beauty in the material world begin in no wise invalidated by his own failure to create pure beauty or to become a quite honest artist. 
a talent so vividly at work as to be almost genius, was incessantly urging him into action, mental action. Realizing, as he did, that it is possible to be very watchfully cognizant of that quality of our moments as their pass, and so shape them after one's own ideal much more continuously and consciously than most people have ever thought of trying to do. He made for himself many souls, souls of intricate pattern and elaborate color, webbed into infinite tiny cells, each the home of a strange perfume, perhaps a poison. Every soul had its own secret and was secluded from the soul which had gone before it or was to come after it. And this showman of souls was not always aware that he was juggling with real things, for to him they were no more than the colored glass balls which the juggler keeps in the air, catching them one after another. For the most part, the souls were content to be playthings. Now and again, they took a malicious revenge and became so real that even the juggler was aware of it. But when they became too real, he had to go on throwing them into the air and catching them, even though the skill of the game had lost its interest for him. But as he never lost his self-possession, his audience, the world, did not see the difference. Thus, not wishing to live for himself, Wilde was surprised into living mainly for others, and his ever-present desire to astonish was one of the prime causes that led to his overthrow. Yet, in spite of this, what riches of the mind one easily divines him to possess, if for a moment we peer beyond the mobile curtain of his paradoxes. Those who listened to him, this modern Saint Chrysostom, on whose lips there was ever an ambiguous smile, could not fail to see that he spoke to himself, was occupied in translating that which was passing in his mind, trying, in a sense, to ravish his auditors and plunge them even into greater, though only ephemeral, ravishment, whilst ushering them into an absolutely unreal and immaterial kingdom of capricious fantasy, and they will remember that he was sometimes astonishingly profound and grave, and always charming, paradoxical, and eloquent. His mind constantly dwelt upon the questions of art and aesthetics. In Intentions, he laid down serious problems which, in themselves, bore every appearance of contradiction, and which any attempt to resolve would, at the outset, appear puerile and ambitious. For instance, is lying a fundamental principle of art, that is to say, of every art? Is it possible for there to be perfect concordance between a finely ordered and pure life and the worship of beauty, or are we to consider such a consummation as utterly impossible and chimerical? Must there be a permanent and necessary divorce between ethics and aesthetics? Ought we, beneath the flowery mask of a borrowed smile, allow ourselves to be carried away by all the waves of instinct? The art of criticism, is it superior to art? The interpreter, can he be superior to the creator? Must we modify the profound axiom to understand is to equal, not by reducing it to that other axiom, more profound perhaps, to understand is to achieve, but by modifying it with that which, at the first glance, looks at least passingly strange, to understand is to surpass. Such are the questions which Wilde postulated in intentions, and worked out with great audacity, but with no higher object than to win admiration, and all this with the indifferent suppleness of a conjurer of words. 
Intentions is a study of artificial genius, culture and instinct, and, for this reason, it forms a most curious production. In itself, it can hardly be termed a magistral work, inasmuch as all the theories enunciated in it are, at least, twenty years old, and appear to us today quite worn out and decrepit. As much may be said also for the theories put forward by our young, contemporaneous artists, who undertake to discuss all things in heaven and earth, and whose vaporings on life, nature, social art, and other things, especially other things, are no more guaranteed against mortality than the doctrines above specified. Let them remember, in reading Wilde's work, that their aesthetical doctrines will soon become as antiquated, and that it is no bid for lasting fame to write flashy novels, pretty verses, high-flown or realistic dramas, pessimistic or optimistic plays, imbued with Schopenhauerian and Nietzschean principles, since the crying need of the time is for sincere work. All the doctrines ever invented are mere tittle-tattle, only fit to amuse brainless ladies wanting in beauty, or minds stricken with positive sterility. It is not inexact that in intentions one meets with a profound truth now and again, but the dressing of it is so paradoxical that we run a risk of misinterpreting all that may animate it of genuine fitness and sincerity. Wilde may truly be denominated the last representative of that English art of the 19th century, which, beginning with Shelley, continuing with the pre-Raphaelites and culminating with the American painter Whistler, endeavours purposely to set forth an ideal and elegant expression of the world. The mistake of these men lies in the belief that art was made for life, whereas it is, as a matter of fact, quite the contrary. Life has no other value except as subject matter for poet and painter. These are eccentric theories, certainly, but then, what on earth does it matter about theories? Do not they serve the great artist to make his genius more puissant, and enable him to concentrate all his forces in the same direction by uniting instead of scattering them? With, or in spite of his theories, Shelley wrote his poems and Whistler painted his pictures. If their aesthetic basis was bad, one at least cannot pretend that it was dangerous, since it enabled them to accomplish their masterpieces. Wilde, unfortunately, was an aesthete before he was a poet, and produced his works somewhat in the spirit of bravado. He had been told that he could not create aught of good. The reply, triumphant and crushing, was the picture of Dorian Gray. He is a literary problem, and in considering him we are struck with the unwarranted corruption, by his acquaintances, of a fine artistic sensibility. The fashionable drawing rooms of the West End brought about his downfall, or rather, and it amounts to the same thing, his frank and undisguised desire to please and to dazzle them proved his undoing. Possibly the same misfortune would have overtaken Merimee, had it not been for his lofty and vigorous intelligence. As it was, he lost more than once most precious time in composing Chambre Bleue, when he was undoubtedly capable of producing another Columba, and other variations of Vases Etrusque. With all this, let us be thoroughly just, Intentions is far from containing anything but mere paradoxes. Those that we find there are at any rate of very diverse kinds. Some are pure verbal amusements and may be thrust aside after a moment's attention that they snatched from our surprise. Others belong to a nobler family of ideas and awaken in us the lasting and fecund astonishment of the paradox, which is born sound and healthy, because it concerns a new truth, 
into the mental landscape these paradoxes introduce that sudden change of perspective which forces the mind to rise or to descend and thus causes us to discover other horizons what a grievous error would it be on our part not to feel something of that immense and exhaustive love of beauty which haunted the soul of wilde until the bitter end however artificial his work may appear at the first glance there is still sufficient left of the man which was incomparable we instinctively feel that he belonged to the chosen race of those upon whom the spirit of the hour had laid his magic wand and who give forth at the cunning touch of the magician some of the finest notes of which our stunted human nature is capable men thus endowed enjoy the rare privilege of being unable to proffer a single word without our perceiving however confusedly the splendid harmony of an almost universal accompaniment of ideas the choir their eyes fixed upon the eyes of the master musician follows his inspired gestures with jealous care and seeks to interpret his every nod and movement none but an artist could have written the admirable pages on shakespeare greek art and other elevated themes that are to be found in the works of oscar wilde more than an artist was he who noted down the suggestive thought that the humility of the matter of a work of art is an element of culture if therefore we hear him exclaim that thought is a sickness we must bear in mind that this is simply an analysis of the phrase we live in a period whose reading is too vast to allow it to become wise and which thinks too much to be beautiful our eyes can no longer penetrate the esoteric meaning of the statues of the olden times beautiful with glorified animality and which have alas become for us little more than the tongue-tied offspring of the inspiring god pan dead beyond all hope of rebirth our brains have become stupefied through the heaviness of the flesh and this perhaps because we have treated the flesh as a slave the worship of the senses wrote wilde has often and with much justice been decried men feeling a natural instinct of terror about passions and sensations that seem stronger than themselves and that they are conscious of sharing with the less highly organized forms of existence but it is probable that the true nature of the senses has never been understood and that they have remained savage and animal merely because the world has sought to starve them into submission or to kill them by pain instead of aiming at making them elements of a new spirituality of which a fine instinct for beauty will be the dominant characteristic in these lines we may perhaps find the key of a certain metamorphosis in the poet's life before Kirke, that terrible sorceress, had passed his way. Who knows not Kirke, the daughter of the sun, whose charmed cup whoever tasted, lost his upright shape and downward fell into a grovelling swine? Milton, Comus, 50-53 The infant king of Rome, we're told, looking out from a window of the Louvre one day, at the muddy street where young children were playing, sad in the midst of a perfumed and divinely flattering court cried out i too would like to roll myself in that beautiful mud we are inclined to think from a sentimental outlook that wilde also had the same morbid desire but he was worth better things and there were times in his life when serene aspirations moved his heart before he sat down to the festive board of sin he had a pronounced tendency towards the discipulat used to question youths about their studies and their mind showing as much interest in them as a spiritual confessor inebriating himself with their enthusiasm and surrounding himself more and more with a medley of different friends a vigorous pagan 
ardent, intoxicated with souvenirs of antiquity, heart-sick of his worldly successes, he dreamed, perhaps, of living over again. Ces héroïques jours où les gens pensaient, allaient chercher le miel au lèvre dans Platon. But this artificiel de l'art was, although he watered it not, a man who rioted in the good things of life. He sought to inculcate in himself a quiet spirit, which believes itself invulnerable. And when we reach the true culture that is our aim, we attain to that perfection of which the saints have dreamed, the perfection of those to whom sin is impossible, not because they make the renunciations of the ascetic, but because they can do everything they wish without hurt to the soul, and can wish for nothing that can do the soul harm, the soul being an entity so divine that it is able to transform into elements of a richer experience, or a finer susceptibility, or a newer mode of thoughts, acts, or passions that with the common would be commonplace, or with the uneducated ignoble, or with the shameful vile. This passage shows us a state of things very far removed from the old dream of antiquity. He forgot, alas, the puritanism and sublime discourses of Diotime, which have been so finely pictured for us by Plato, to wallow in the orgies of the island of Capria. Before that criminal court where he vainly struggled so as not to appear naked before men, we hear him proclaim what he had himself desired and perhaps attained. What interpretation, asked the judge, can you give us of the verse, I am the love which dares not tell its name? The love referred to, replied Wilde, is that which exists between a man of mature years and a young man, the love of David and of Jonathan. It is the same love that Plato made the basis of his philosophy. It is that love which is sung in the sonnets of Shakespeare and of Michelangelo. It is a profound spiritual affection, as pure as it is perfect. It is beautiful, pure and noble. It is intellectual, the love of a man possessing full experience of life and of a young man full of all the joy and all the hope of the future. There in that struggle in the midst of thick darkness, this must have been the cry of his tormented soul, a breath of pure air as he passed, a perfumed memory. Then there came a few arrow flights badly winged which only wounded his own heart. He defended himself in an indifferent way according to some people although it must be admitted that he gave the answers that were necessary and becoming, and in some cases compelled his judges, who were no better than the mouthpieces of the crowd, to confess the hatred that the worship of beauty had inspired. However strange may have been his attitude, that attitude could not have been indifferent to anyone. Those who have been fortunate enough to laugh at the portrait that René Boilev has drawn of the Hestite in his fine novel, The Parfum des Îles Barhomies, would find it difficult to make a mock of the man who accepted with superb disinterestedness the torture that he knew beforehand the judges would inevitably inflict upon him. Although he may not have been a great poet, although the pretext of his equivocal mode of living was taken to condemn him, we cannot lose sight of the art and of the literary craftsmen that were condemned at the same time with him. We know no spectacle so ridiculous as the British public in one of its periodical fits of morality. In general, elopements, divorces, and family quarrels pass with little notice. We read the scandal, talk about it for a day, and forget it. But once in six or seven years, our virtue becomes outrageous. We cannot suffer the laws of religion and decency to be violated. We must take a stand against vice. We must teach libertines that the English people appreciate the importance of domestic ties. Accordingly, some unfortunate man, 
in no respect more depraved than hundreds whose offences have been treated with lenity, is singled out as an expiatory sacrifice. If he has children, they are to be taken from him. If he has a profession, he is to be driven from it. He is cut by the higher orders and hissed by the lower. He is, in truth, a sort of whipping boy by whose vicarious agonies all the other transgressors of the same class are, it is supposed, sufficiently chastised. This bitter denunciation of English mock modesty by the brilliant essayist rests upon thoroughly justifiable grounds. Once again, in the dolorous history of humanity, the grotesque farce was enacted of chasing forth the scapegoat into the wilderness to bear away the sins of the people. But in this instance, the unhappy creature was not only laden with the sins of the tribe, a heavier burden still had been added to all the others. The fearful burden of the mad, unreasoned hatred of the sinners. Indeed, he, whose share in the general load of sin was the greatest, sought to add more hatred than all the others to the great fardel under which the victim staggered, and believing himself so much the more innocent that the abjection of the unfortunate wretch was complete, would have been glad had it been in his power to help even the public hangman in the execution of his nefarious task. We have observed that, through some diabolical strain in human nature, the evil joy which creates scandal and gives rise to a man's downfall increases in intensity if the victim happens to be a man of superior rank and talent. On voit brûler au fond des prunelles hanusées, les auguelles mystérieux de soule la beauté. How great must have been the delighted intoxication of numberless weak minds when they were impelled, in the midst of a silence that braver and clearer spirits dared not break, to screech out vociferations against art and thought, denouncing these as the accomplices of the momentary aberrations of him who erstwhile worshipped at their shrine. Here in France, at least, men knew better how to restrain themselves, and there were even a few courageous wielders of talented pens who did not hesitate to use their abilities in favour of their Anglo-Saxon colleague. Hugues Rebel published in the Mercure de France that défense d'Oscar Wilde, the calm and tempered logic of which is still fresh to many minds. A number of writers and artists even held a meeting of protestation. But, of course, all this had not the slightest effect on the judicial position of Wilde. It was generally felt that the ferocious outcry raised against the unhappy man who had been found out was because that man was a poet, and not so much because he had gone counter to the manners of his time. Amongst all the mingled shouting and laughter, the arguments for and the arguments against, the voice of one man was heard stentorian and clear above all the rest. That voice belonged to Octave Mirbeau, a puissant master of the French tongue and a brilliant writer and dramatist. The following lines of suppressed anger and large-minded charity emanated from his pen. A great deal has been heard about the paradoxes of Oscar Wilde upon art, beauty, conscience and life. Paradoxes they were, it is true, and we know that some let themselves open to the charge of exaggeration and vaulted over the threshold of the forbidden. But after all, what is a paradox, if not, for the most part of the time, the exaltation of an idea in a striking and superior form. As soon as an idea overleaps the low level of ordinary popular understanding, having ceased to drag behind it the ignoble stumps gathered in the swamps of middle-class morality, and seeks, with strong, steadfast wing, to attain the lofty heights of philosophy, literature or art, we at once stigmatize it 
as a paradox, because unable ourselves to follow it into those regions which are inaccessible to us through the weakness of our organs, and we make haste to scotch it and put it on the ban by flinging after it curse-laden cries of blame and contempt. And yet, strange it may seem, progress cannot be made save by way of paradox, whilst much vaunted common sense, the prized virtue of the imbecile, perpetuates the humdrum routine of daily life. The truth is, we refuse to allow anyone to come and outrage our intellectual sluggishness or our morality, ready-made like second-hand clothes in a dealer's shop, or the stupid security of our sheepish preconceptions. Look at that, squarely. That was the veritable crime in the minds of those who sat in judgment on Oscar Wilde. They could not forgive him for being a thinker, and a man of superior intellect, and for that self-same reason eminently dangerous to other men. Wilde is young and has a future before him, and he has proved by the strong and charming words which he has already given us that he can still do much more in the cause of beauty and art. Must we not then admit that it is an abominable thing to risk the killing of something far above all laws and all morality, the spirit of beauty, for the sake of repressing acts which are not really punishable per se. For laws change, and morality becomes transformed with the transformations of time, with the changing of latitude and longitude, but beauty remains immaculate, and sheds her light far over the centuries that she alone can rescue from obscurity. With these magnificent words of one of the great masters of French prose, we would gladly terminate the present study, but it remains for us to cite the following from the pen of our lately deceased friend, Hugh Rebel, who possessed not only acumen and erudition, but employed a brilliant style and ready wit in the expression of his thoughts. Will a day ever come, wrote he, when the deeds of men will be no more judged in the name of religion and morality, but from the point of view of their social importance? When the misdemeanors of a man of wit and of genius, or a clever, elegant man of fashion, shall no longer be judged by the same law as that which condemns a stolid navvy or a deckyard hand. Far from believing in our much belauded progress, I am inclined, alas, to think that we are really far behind our forefathers in tolerance, and above all, in the ideas that govern our idea of social equality. The downfall of the sentiment of hierarchy seriously compromises the existence of some of the best men amongst us. It is not crime merely which is tracked and hounded down, but all that strays aside for a moment from everyday habits and customs. So and so, because he is not like other people, inspires aversion, even horror on the part of those who take off their hats most respectfully to the successful swindler, and whilst the police complacently allow the perpetration in our great cities of robberies and murders, they make a raid on the unfortunate bookseller who happens to have stowed away carefully in his back shop a few illustrations where the high deeds and gestures of Venus are too faithfully reproduced. These paltry persecutions would only serve to bring a smile to our lips, were it not that everyone is more or less exposed to their arbitrary measures. Men are far less free today than they formerly were, because they are too much dominated by a large number of ignorant and groundless prejudices, Ferocious jailers fetter and imprison their minds for their greater overthrow. No longer do they believe in God whilst giving implicit faith to vain science which, making small account of the great diversity of character and temperament amongst human beings, holds up for unique example a healthy and virtuous individual who never had any real existence except in the imagination of fools, and whilst no longer following any of the old religions, they submit themselves with equanimity to the condemnation of so-called human justice which more often than not is radically venal, and impresses them far more than did in olden times, 
the excommunicating bulls of popes who had usurped the authority of God. As for the sentence of hard labour passed upon Wilde, a description would fail to convey to the inexperienced reader a full idea of its barbarous severity. Sir Edward Clarke, the counsel for the defence, gave substantially the following reply to the representative of a Paris newspaper. My opinion is that Oscar Wilde will work out his sentence. He has received the heaviest punishment that it was possible to inflict upon him. You cannot possibly form any notion of the extreme severity of hard labour which is implacable in its regime of absorbing and exigent regularity. Oscar Wilde, who wore his hair long like the esthete he was, was obliged to undergo the indignity of having it cut close, and wearing the sackcloth suit bearing the broad arrow mark of the convict, thrust into a small narrow cell with only a bed, or rather a wooden plank in guise of a bed, for all his furniture a bed without a mattress, and with a bolster made of wood. This talented man was to pass the long, weary months of his martyrdom. The labour given him to do was absolutely ridiculous for a man of his bent. First of all, for a certain number of hours, he had to sit on a stool in his cell, and disentangle and reduce to small quantities ship-rope of enormous size, used for docking ocean liners, the only instrument allowed him to effect the work being a nail and his own fingers. The result of this painful and atrocious penitence was to tear and disfigure his hands beyond all hope. After that he was conducted into a court where he had to displace a certain number of cannonballs, carrying them from one place to another and arranging them in symmetrical piles. No sooner was this edifying labour terminated than he had himself to undo it all and carry back the cannonballs one by one to the place from whence he had first taken them. Then, finally, he was made to work the treadmill, which is a harder task than those even that we have endeavoured faintly to describe. Imagine, if you can, an enormous wheel in the interior of a witch, exist cunningly arranged winding steps. Wilde, mounting on one of the steps, would immediately set the wheel in motion by the movement of his feet. Then the steps follow each other under the feet in rapid and regular evolution, thus forcing the legs to a precipitous action, which becomes laborious, enervating and even maddening after a few minutes. But this enervating fatigue and suffering the convict is obliged to overcome, whilst continuing to move his legs for all they are worth, if he would escape being knocked down, caught up and thrown over by the revolving movement of the wheel. The fantastical exercise lasts a quarter of an hour, and the wretch obliged to indulge in it is allowed five minutes rest before the silly game recommences. The convict is always kept apart and not allowed to speak even to his gaola, except at certain moments. All correspondence and reading is forbidden, save for the Bible and prayer book, placed at the head of the wooden plank, which serves him for a bed, and relatives are not admitted to see him excepting at the end of the year. His food consists of meat and black bread, and of course water is allowed. The meal times take place at fixed hours, for naturally he has to follow a regular regime in order to accomplish the hard labours that are incumbent upon him. Many of the convicts have been known to say, on coming out of prison, that they would have far more preferred to pass ten years in penal servitude than work out two years of hard labour. The moral suffering men like Oscar Wilde are forced to undergo is probably superior even to their physical distress, and I can only repeat that this labour is the severest which the laws of England impose. Wilde endured this martyrdom to the bitter end, the only favour allowed him being permission, towards the end of the time, to read a few books and to write. He read Dante in his entirety, dwelling longer over the poet's description of hell than anything else, because here he recognised himself at home. Before the doors of the jail had been bolted on him, he wrote with a pen that had been dipped in colourless ink, letters of tears, sobs and pains, which were issued to the world only after the unhappy man had winged his flight for another planet. Those letters bear every mark of the deepest sincerity. They are not so much literature as the wail of a broken heart, which had attached itself to the only human affection he believed was still faithful to him. It is impossible to treat lightly the passionate anguish which 
refrains from expressing itself with the same intensity as the sorrows it had suffered, stricken with infinite sadness at the utter shipwreck of all hope, and the cowardice of the human nature that had brought him to such low estate. That he should have conjured up the happy times he had seen decked out in all the charming graces of youth, and which smiled back his visage from the limpid mirror of his marvellously artistic intelligence, is only perfectly natural, and this evocation of happier times took on a new and horribly strange beauty, just as the feeblest ray of light stealing through prison walls gains in puissance from the sheer opacity of enveloping darkness. I will not stop here to inquire whether he found later the consolation he so much desired, a haven of peace in the friendship of the aristocratic adolescent who had unwittingly caused him to become cast away. It is highly probable that the bitter words which André Gide heard him utter referred to that unfortunate intimacy. No, he does not understand me. He can no longer understand me. I repeat to him at each letter, we can no more follow together the same path. You have yours, and it is certainly beautiful, and I have mine. His path is the path of Alcibiade, whilst mine henceforth must be that of St. Francis of Assisi. His last most important work in prose, De Profundis, which reveals him to us under an entirely different aspect, although practically always the same man, shows that he is still engrossed with the perpetual love of attitudinizing, dreaming, perhaps, that in spite of his sorrow and repentance, he will be able to take up again and sing, although in an humbler tone, the pagan hymn that had been strangled in his throat. In this connection, we cannot help thinking of the gesture of the great Tolma, who, whilst he lay a-dying, although he knew it not, took the pendant skin of his thin neck between his fingers, and said to those who stood around, Here is something which would suit finely to make up a visage for an old Tiberius. It seems to us that the chief characteristic of Wilde's book is not so much its admirable accent as its subtle irony, through which there seems to thrill the reply of destiny to the haughty resolutions that he had undertaken. It is as though death itself rose up from each page to sneer and chuckle at the master singer, and few things are more bitter on the part of this poet, who had, with his own hands, ensepulchred himself as a willing holocaust to the deceitful gods of factitious art. Then the constant appeals that he made to nature. The song no longer rings with the old regal note. There is none of the trepidating joy of a Whitman, or the yielding sweetness of an Emerson. Our ear detects only the melopoeia of a heart, which had been wounded in its innermost recess. I tremble with pleasure when I think that on the very day of my leaving prison both the laburnum and the lilac will be blooming in the gardens, and that I shall see the wind stare into restless beauty the swaying gold of the one, and make the other toss the pale purple of its plume, so that all the air shall be Arabia for me. These are the words of a convalescent of a man newly risen from a bed of sickness anticipating a richer and fuller life, unknowing that the uplifted hand of death, suspended just above him, was destined to strike him down at brief delay. In the darkness of his prison cell, he dreams of the mysterious herbs that he will find in the realms of nature, of the balms that he shall ferret out amongst the plants of the earth, and which will bring peace for his anguish, and deep-seated joy for the suffering that racked his brain. But nature, whose sweet rains fall on the unjust and just alike, will have clefts in the rocks where I may hide, and secret valleys in whose silence I may weep undisturbed. She will hang the night with stars, so that I may walk abroad in the darkness without stumbling, 
and send the wind over my footprints so that none may track me to my hurt she will cleanse me in great waters and with bitter herbs make me whole in presence of this beautiful passage it is painful to remember how his hopes were fated to be shattered by the cruelest of disappointments and how he was doomed to die in the grey desolation of a poverty-haunted room before drawing this notice to a close it were not unfitting to recall another name born by a poet of wayward genius who likewise wandered astray in a forest of more than dantean darkness because the right way he had for ever lost from view that poet was a poet of france and the voice of his glory and the echo of the songs he chanted resounded with that proud and melodious note of genius which can never weary human ears although this poet led a life which can be compared only to the life of oscar wilde he belonged to an order of mentality which differs too greatly in its essential features to allow the accidents of the career of the two men being used as a basis for comparing them closely together on the intellectual plane verlaine belonged to that race of poets who distinguish themselves by their perfect spontaneity he was a veritable poet of instinct and had heard voices which no other mortal had heard before him on earth in place of the metallic verses of his predecessors the verses that for the most part are spoken by linguistic artists he created a sort of ethereal music a song so sweet and so penetrating that it haunts us eternally like the low passionate whisperings of a lover's voice he gave us more than royal largesse of a wonderful and delicious soul that had no part or lot in time a music that was created for his soul alone and we have willingly forgotten many a haughtier voice for the bewitching strains that this baptized fawn played for us with such artless joy on his forest-grown reed the english poet was more complex and perhaps less sheerly human and even his errors have no other origin than the perpetual effort to astonish us whilst above all that which staggers us most and stirs us so profoundly is that these self-same errors which had come into life under such innocent conditions became terribly real in virtue of that imperious law which compels certain minds to render their dreams incarnate as for his work however finely polished however exquisite it may be and undoubtedly is we have to confess that it has no power to move our souls into high passion and lofty endeavour although it might easily have sufficed to conquer celebrity for more than one ambitious literary craftsman but we feel with regard to wilde that we had a legitimate right to insist on the accomplishment of far greater things a more sincere and genuine output and are so much more dissatisfied because we clearly see the great discord between the man who palpitated with intense life and the aesthetic dandy whose cleverness overreached itself when he tried to work out that life on admittedly artificial lines this extraordinary divorce between intelligence and willpower was that which gave rise to the striking drama of wilde's career albeit the word drama looks strange and out of place if applied only to the sorrow-filled period that crowned with thorns the latter end of his brilliant existence if it be used for no other reason than to particularise the great catastrophe that took place in the sight of all the world the fact is the man's entire life was one perpetual drama throughout the whole course of his existence he persistently sought after and that with impunity all sorts of excitants that could at last no longer be disguised under the name of experiences and no doubt others more terrible still that fall under no human laws would have come finally to swell the ranks of their forerunners and then had the hand of destiny not arrested him in his course he would have wound up by descending so low 
that the artistic life of his soul would have been forever extinguished that when all is said and done would have been the veritable the irremediable tragedy fortunately royal intellects such as these can never utterly die and therein consists their greatest chastisement spasmodic movements agitate them revealing beneath their mendacious laughter the secret agony of their souls and we are suddenly called upon to witness the heart-rending spectacle of the slow death agony of a haughty talented poet a petronius self-poisoned through fear of caesar or a wild whom a vicious and overwrought public had only half assassinated raising his poor glazed eyes towards the marvellous light of truth whose glorious vision we know by the sure voice that comes from the depths he had caught at last oscar wilde had desired to live a pagan's free and untrammelled life in twentieth century england forgetful of the enormous fact that no longer may we live pagan wise for the shadow of the cross has shed a steadily increasing gloom over the conditions that enlivened the joyous existence of olden times c g end of section two section three in all men's hearts a slumbering swine lies low says the french poet so come ye whose porcine instincts have never been awakened or if rampant successfully hidden and hurl the biggest sharpest stones you can lay your hands on at your wretched degraded humiliated brother who has been found out the life and death of oscar wilde poet playwright poser and convict can only fittingly be summarized as a tragedy every misspent life is a tragedy more or less but how much more tragic appear the elements of despair and disaster when the victim to his own vices is a man of genius exercising a considerable influence upon the thought and culture of his day and possessing every advantage which birth education talent and station can bestow oscar wilde was more than a clever and original thinker he was the inventor of a certain literary style and though his methods showy and eccentric as they were lent themselves readily to imitation none of his followers could approach their master in the particular mode which he had made his own there can be two opinions as to the merits of his plays there can be only one judgment as to their daring and audacious originality of the ordinary and the commonplace wilde had a horror which with him was almost a religion he was unmercifully chaffed throughout america when he appeared in public in a light green suit adorned with a large sunflower but he did not don this outrageous costume because he preferred such startling clothing he adopted the dress in order to be original and assumed it because no other living man was likely to be so garbed he was consumed in fact with overpowering vanity he was possessed of a veritable demon of self-esteem he ate strange foods and drank unusual liquors in order to be unlike any of his contemporaries his eccentricities of dress continued to the end on the first night of one of his plays it was a brilliant triumph he was called upon by an enthusiastic audience for the customary speech he was much exercised in his mind as to what he could say that would be unconventional and sensational no mere platitudes or banalities for the author of lady windermere's fan who made a god of the spirit of epigram and almost canonized the art of repartee he said ladies and gentlemen i'm glad you like my play i like it very much myself too which if candid was hardly the remark of a modest and retiring author the leopard cannot change his spots and neither can the lion his skin even in his beautiful book de profundis surely the most extraordinary volume of recent years 
the man's character is writ so plainly that he who runs may read man of letters man of fashion man of hideous vices oscar wilde remained to the last moment of his murdered life a self-conscious egotist gentlemen he gasped on his deathbed hearing the doctors express misgivings as to their fees it would appear that i am dying beyond my means it was a brilliant sally and one can picture the startled faces of the medical attendants a genius lay a dying and a genius he remained till the breath of life departed genius we know to be closely allied to insanity and it were charitable to describe this man as mad besides approaching very nearly to the truth something was out of gear in that finely attuned mind some thorn there was among the intellectual roses which made him what he was he pined for strange passions new sensations his was the temperament of the roman sybarite he often sighed for a return to the days when vice was deified he spoke of the glories of the devastation the awful woman and the alexandrian school at which little girls and young boys were instructed in all the most secret and unthinkable forms of vice modern women satisfied him not perverted passions consumed the fire of his being he had had children of his wife but sexual intercourse between him and that most unfortunate lady was more honoured in the breach than in the observance they had their several rooms on many occasions wilde actually brought the companions of his abominable rites and sinful joys to his own home and indulged in his frightful propensities beneath the roof of the house which sheltered his own sons and their most unhappy mother could the man capable of this atrocity possess a normal mind can oscar wilde who committed moral suicide and made of himself a social pariah be regarded as a sane man london society is not so strict nor straight-laced that it will not forgive much laxity in its devoted votaries rumour had been busy with the name of oscar wilde for a long time before the whole awful truth became known he was seen constantly at theatres and restaurants with persons in no way fit to be his associates and these persons were not girls or women he paraded his shameful friendships and flaunted his villainous companions in society's face people began to look askance at the famous wit doors began to be closed to him he was ostracised by all but the most bohemian coteries but even those who were still proud to rank him among their friends did not know how far he had wilfully drawn himself into the web of disgrace much that seemed strange and unaccountable was attributed to his well-known love of pose men shrugged their shoulders and declared that wilde meant no harm it was his vainglorious way of showing his contempt for the opinion of the world men of such parts could not be judged by ordinary standards intellectually wilde was fit to mix with the immortals if he preferred the society of miserable beardless stunted youths destitute alike of decency or honour it was no affair of theirs and so on ad nauseam meanwhile heedless of the warnings of friends and the sneers of foes wilde went his own way to destruction he was addicted to the vice and crime of sodomy long before he formed a friendship which was destined to involve him in irretrievable ruin in london he met a younger son of the eccentric marquis of queensbury lord alfred douglas by name this youth was being educated at cambridge he was of peculiar temperament and talented in a strong frothy style he was good-looking in an effeminate ladylike way he wrote verse his poems not being of a manner which could be acceptable to a self-respecting publication 
his efforts appeared in an eccentric and erratic magazine which was called the chameleon in this precious serial appeared a poem from the pen of lord alfred dedicated to his father in these filial words to the man i hate Oscar Wilde at once developed an extraordinary and dangerous interest in this immature literary egg. A being of his own stamp, after his own heart, was Lord Alfred Douglas. The love of women delighted him not. The possession of a young girl's person had no charm for him. He yearned for higher flights in the realms of love. He sought unnatural affection. Wilde, experienced in all the symptoms of a disordered sexual fancy contrived to exercise a remarkable and sinister influence over this youth again and again and again did his father implore lord alfred douglas to separate himself from the tempter lord queensbury threatened persuaded bribed urged cajoled all to no purpose wilde and his son were constantly together the nature of their friendship became the talk of the town. It was proclaimed from the housetops. The Marquis, determined to rescue him if it were humanly possible, horsewhipped his son in a public thoroughfare and was threatened with a summons for assault. On one occasion, it was the opening night of one of the wild plays, he sent the author a bouquet of choice. Vegetables! Three or four times he wrote to him begging him to cancel his friendship with Lord Alfred. Once he called at the house in Tite Street and there was a terrible scene. The Marquis fumed, Wilde laughed. He assured his lordship that only at his son's own request would he break off the association which existed between them. The Marquis, driven to desperation, called Wilde a disgusting name. The latter with a show of wrath, ordered the peer from his door, and he was obliged to leave. At all costs and hazards, at the risk of any pain and grief to himself, Lord Queensbury was determined to break off the disgraceful liaison. He stopped his son's allowance, but Wilde had, at that time, plenty of money, and his purse was his friend's. At last the father went to the length of leaving an insulting message for Oscar Wilde at that gentleman's club. He called there and asked for Wilde. The clerk at the inquiry office stated that Mr Wilde was not on the premises. The Marquis then produced a card and wrote upon it in pencil these words, Oscar Wilde is a bugger. This elegant missive he directed to be handed to the author when he should next appear at the club. From this card, Lord Queensbury's last resource, grew the whole great case, which amazed and horrified the world in 1895. Oscar Wilde was compelled, however reluctantly, to take the matter up. Had he remained quiescent under such a public affront, his career in England would have been at an end. He bowed to the inevitable and a libel action was prepared. One is often compelled to wonder if he foresaw the outcome. One asks oneself if he realised what defeat in this case would portend. The stakes were desperately high. He risked, in a court of law, his reputation, his position, his career, and even his freedom. Did he know what the end to it all would be? Whatever Wilde's fears and expectations were, his opponent did not underestimate the importance of the issue. If he could not induce a jury of twelve of his fellow countrymen to believe that the plaintiff was what he had termed him, he, the Marquis of Queensbury, would be himself disgraced. Furthermore, there would, in the event of failure, be heavy damages to pay, and the poor man was not over-rich. Wilde had many and powerful friends— for reasons which it is not necessary to enlarge upon, Lord Queensbury was not liked or respected by his own order. The ultimate knowledge that he was a father striving to save a loved son from infamy changed all that, and his lordship met with nothing but sympathy from the general public in the latter stages of the great case. Sir Edward Clarke was retained for the plaintiff, 
It is needless to refer to the high estimation in which this legal and political luminary is held by all classes of society. From first to last, he devoted himself to the lost cause of Oscar Wilde with a whole-hearted devotion which was beyond praise. The upshot of the libel action must have pained and disgusted him, yet he refused to abandon his client, and in the two criminal trials defended him with a splendid loyalty and with the marked ability that might be expected from such a counsel. The acute, energetic, silver-spoken Mr. Carson led on the other side. It is not necessary to make more than passing mention of the conspicuous skill with which the able lawyer conducted the case for the defendant. Even the gifted plaintiff himself cut a sorry figure when opposed to Mr. Carson. Extraordinary interest was displayed in the action, and the courts were besieged on each day that the trial lasted. Remarkable revelations were expected, and they were indeed forthcoming. Enormous pains had been taken to provide a strong defence, and it was quite clear almost after the first day that Wilde's case would infallibly break down. He made some astonishing admissions in the witness box, and even disgusted many of his friends by the flippancy and affected unconcern of his replies to questions of the most damaging nature. He, apparently, saw nothing indecorous in facts which must shock any other than the most depraved. He saw nothing disgusting in friendships of a kind to which only one construction could be put. He gave expensive dinners to ex-barmen and the like, ignorant, brutish young fools, because they amused him. He presented youths of a questionable moral character with silver cigarette cases because their society was pleasant. He took young men to share his bedroom at hotels and saw nothing remarkable in such proceedings. He gave sums of thirty pounds to ill-bred youths, accomplished blackmailers, because they were hard up and he felt they did not deserve poverty. He assisted other young men of a character equally undesirable to go to America and received letters from them in which they addressed him as Dear Oscar and sent him their love. In short, his own statements damned him. Out of his own mouth, and he posing all the time, was he convicted. The case could have but one ending. Sir Edward Clark, pained, surprised, shocked, consented to a verdict for the Marquis of Queensbury, and the great libel case was at an end. The defendant left the court proudly erect, conscious that he had been the means of saving his son and of eradicating from society a canker which had been rotting it unnoticed, except by a few, for a very long time. Oscar Wilde left the court a ruined and despised man. People, there were one or two left who were loyal to him, turned aside from him with loathing. He had nodded to six or seven friends in court on the last day of the trial, and turned ashen pale when he observed their averted looks. All was over for him. The little supper parties with a few choice wits, the glorious intoxication of first-night applause, the orgies in the infamous dens of his boon companions, all these were no more for him. Oscar Wilde, bon vivant, man of letters, arbiter of literary fashion, stood at the bar of public opinion, a wretch guilty of crimes against which the body recoils and the mind revolts. Oh, what a falling off was there! If any reader would care to know the impression made upon the opinion of the London world by the revelations of this lawsuit, let him turn to the Daily Telegraph of the morning following the dramatic result of the trial. In that great newspaper appeared a leading article in reference to Oscar Wilde, the terms of which, though deserved, were most scathing, denunciatory and bitter. Yet a general feeling of relief permeated the regret which was universally expressed at so terrible a termination of a distinguished career. 
society was at no pains to hide its relief that the orgean stable has been cleansed and that a terrible scandal had been exercised from its midst it now becomes a necessary albeit painful task to describe the happenings incidental or subsequent to the wild and queensbury proceedings it was certain that matters could not be allowed to rest as they were a jury in a public court had convinced themselves that Lord Queensbury's allegations were strictly true, and the duty of the public prosecutor was truly clear. The law is not, or should not be, a respecter of persons, and Oscar Wilde, genius though he were, was not less amenable to the law than would be any ignorant boor suspected of similar crimes. The machinery of legal process was set in action, and the arrest of Wilde followed as a matter of course. A prominent name in the libel action against Lord Queensbury had been that of one Alfred Taylor. This individual, besides being himself guilty of the most infamous practices, had, it would appear, for long acted as a sort of precursor for the apostle of culture, and his capture took place at nearly the same time as that of his principal. The latter was arrested at a certain quiet and fashionable hotel, whither he had gone with one or two yet loyal friends after the trial for libel. His arrest was not unexpected, of course, but it created a tremendous sensation, and vast crowds collected at Bow Street Police Station and in the vicinity during the preliminary examinations before the magistrate. The prisoner Wilde bore himself with some show of fortitude, but it was clear that the iron had already entered into his soul, and his old air of jaunty indifference to the opinion of the world had plainly given way to a mental anxiety which could not altogether be hidden, though it could be controlled. On one occasion, as fur-coated, silk-hatted, he entered the dock, he nodded familiarly to the late Sir Augustus Harris, but that magnet of the theatrical world deliberately turned his back upon the playwriting celebrity. The evidence from first to last was followed with the most intense interest, and the end of it was that Oscar Wilde was fully committed for trial. The case came on at the Old Bailey during the month of April 1895, and it was seen that the interest had in no wise abated. Mr Justice Charles presided, and he was accompanied by the customary retinue of corporation dignitaries. The court was crowded in every part, and hundreds of people were unsuccessful in efforts to obtain admission. A reporter for a Sunday newspaper wrote, Wilde's personal appearance has changed little since his committal from Bow Street. He wears the same clothes and continues to carry the same hat. He looks haggard and worn, and his long hair that was so carefully arranged when last he was in the court, though not then in the dock, is now disheveled. Taylor, on the other hand, still neatly dressed, appears not to have suffered from his enforced confinement, but he no longer attempts to regard the proceedings with that indifference which he affected when first before the magistrate. As soon as Wilde and his confederate took their places in the dock, each held a whispered consultation with his counsel, and the clerk of arraigns then read over the indictments. Both prisoners pleaded, Not guilty. Not guilty. Taylor speaking in a loud and confident tone. Wilde spoke quietly, looked very grave, and gave attentive heed to the formal opening proceedings. Mr. C. F. Gill led for the prosecution, and he rose amidst a breathless silence to outline the main facts of the case. After begging the jury to dismiss from their minds anything that they might have heard or read in regard to the affair, and to abandon all prejudice on either side, he described at some length the circumstances which led up to the present prosecution. He spoke of the arrest and committal of the Marquis of Queensbury on a charge of criminal libel, and of the collapse of the case for the prosecution when the case was heard at the Old Bailey. 
he alluded to the subsequent inevitable arrest of Wilde and Taylor, and of the committal of both prisoners to take their trial at the present sessions. Wilde, he said, was well known as a dramatic author and generally as a literary man of unusual attainments. He had resided until his arrest at a house in Tite Street, Chelsea, where his wife lived with the children of the marriage. Taylor had had numerous addresses, but for the time covered by these charges had dwelt in Little College Street and afterwards in Chapel Street. Although Wilde had a house in Tite Street, he had at different times occupied rooms in St. James's Place, the Savoy Hotel and the Albemarle Hotel. It would be shown that Wilde and Taylor were in league for certain purposes, and Mr Gale then explained the specific allegations against the prisoners. Wilde, he asserted, had not hesitated, soon after his first introduction to Taylor, to explain to him to what purpose he wished to put their acquaintance. Taylor was familiar with a number of young men who were in the habit of giving their bodies, or selling them, to other men for the purpose of sodomy. It appeared that there were a number of youths engaged in this abominable traffic, and that one and all of them were known to Taylor, who went about and sought out for them men of means who were willing to pay heavily for the indulgence of their favourite vice. Mr Gill endeavoured to show that Taylor himself was given to sodomy, and that he had himself indulged in these filthy practices with the same youths as he agreed to procure for Wilde. The visits of the latter to Taylor's rooms were touched upon, and the circumstances attending these visits were laid bare. On nearly every occasion when Wilde called, a young man was present with whom he committed the act of sodomy. The names of various young men connected with these facts were mentioned in turn, and the case of the two Parkers was given as a sample of many others on which the learned counsel preferred to dwell with less minuteness. When Taylor gave up his rooms in Little College Street and took up his abode in Chapel Street, he left behind him a number of compromising papers which would be produced in evidence against the prisoners. And he should submit in due course that there was abundant corroboration of the statements of the youths involved. Mr Gill pointed out the peculiarities in the case of Frederick Atkins. This youth had accompanied the prisoner Wilde to Paris, and there could be no doubt whatever that the latter had in the most systematic way endeavoured to influence this young man's mind towards vicious courses and had endeavoured to mould him to his own depraved will. The relations which had existed between the prisoner and another lad, one Alfred Wood, were also fully described, and the learned counsel made special allusion to the remarkable manner in which Wilde had lavished money upon Wood prior to the departure of that youth for America. Mr Gill referred to yet another of Wilde's youthful familiars, namely Sidney Mavor, in regard to whom, he said, the jury must form their own conclusions after they had heard the evidence. Among other things to which he would ask them to direct careful attention was a letter written in pencil by Taylor, the prisoner, to this youth. The communication ran, Dear Sid, I cannot wait any longer. Come at once and see Oscar at Tite Street. I am yours ever, Alfred Taylor. The use of the Christian name of Wilde in so familiar a way suggested the nature of the acquaintance which existed between Mavor and Wilde, who was old enough to be his father. In conclusion, Mr Gill asked the jury to give the case, painful as it must necessarily be, their most earnest and careful consideration. Both Wilde and Taylor paid keen attention to the opening statement. They exchanged no word together, and it was observed that Wilde kept as far apart from his companion in the dock as he possibly could. The first witness called was Charles Parker. He proved to be a rather smartly attired youth, fresh-coloured and, of course, clean-shaven. He was very pale and appeared uneasy. 
he stated that he had first met Taylor at the St. James's restaurant. The latter had got into conversation with him and the young fellows with him, and had insisted on standing drinks. Conversation of a certain nature passed between them. Taylor called attention to the prostitutes who frequent Piccadilly Circus, and remarked, I can't understand sensible men wasting their money on painted trash like that. Many do, though, but there are a few who know better. Now you could get money in a certain way easily enough, if you cared to. The witness had formerly been a valet, and he was at this time out of employment. He understood to what Taylor alluded and made a coarse reply. Mr. Gill. I am obliged to ask you what it was you actually said. Witness. I do not like to say. You were less squeamish at the time, I dare say. I ask you for the words. I said that if any old gentleman with money took a fancy to me, I was agreeable. I was terribly hard up. What did Taylor say? He laughed and said that men far cleverer, richer and better than I preferred things of that kind. Did Taylor mention the prisoner Wilde? Not at that time. He arranged to meet me again, and I consented. Where did you first meet Wilde? At the Solferino restaurant. Tell me what transpired. Taylor said he could introduce me to a man who was good for plenty of money. Wilde came in later, and I was formally introduced. Dinner was served for four in a private room. Who made the fourth? My brother, William Parker. I had promised Taylor that he should accompany me. What happened during dinner? There was plenty of champagne and brandy and coffee. We all partook of it. Of what nature was the conversation? General, at first. Nothing was then said as to the purposes for which we had come together. And then? Wilde invited me to go to his rooms at the Savoy Hotel. Only he and I went, leaving my brother and Taylor behind. Wilde and I went in a cab. At the Savoy we went to his, Wilde's, sitting room. More drink was offered you there? Yes, we had liqueurs. Let us know what occurred. He committed the act of sodomy upon me. With your consent? The witness did not reply. Further examined, he said that Wilde on that occasion had given him two pounds and asked him to call upon him again a week later. He did so. The same thing occurred and Wilde then gave him three pounds. The witness next described a visit to Little College Street to Taylor's rooms. Wilde used to call there and the same thing occurred as at the Savoy. For a fortnight or three weeks, the witness lodged in Park Walk, close to Taylor's house. There, too, he was visited by Wilde. The witness gave a detailed account of the disgusting proceedings there. He said, I was asked by Wilde to imagine that I was a woman and that he was my lover. I had to keep up this illusion. I used to sit on his knees and he used to play with my privates as a man might amuse himself with a girl. Wilde insisted in this filthy make-believe being kept up. Wilde gave him a silver cigarette case and a gold ring, both of which articles he pawned. The prisoner said, I don't suppose boys are different to girls in acquiring presents from them who are fond of them. He remembered Wilde having rooms at St. James's Place and the witness visited him there. Where else have you been with Wilde? To Ketna's restaurant. What happened there? We dined there. We always had a lot of wine. Wilde would talk of poetry and art during dinner and of the old Roman days. On one occasion you proceeded from Ketna's to Wilde's house. Yes, we went to Tide Street. It was very late at night. Wilde let himself and me in with a latch key. I remained the night, sleeping with the prisoner and he himself let me out in the early morning, before anyone was about. Where else have you visited this man? At the Albemarle Hotel. The same thing happened then. Where did your last interview take place? I last saw Wilde in Trafalgar Square, about nine months ago. 
He was in a hansom and saw me. He alighted from the hansom. What did he say? He said, well, you are looking as pretty as ever. He didn't ask me to go anywhere with him then. The witness went on to say that during the period of his acquaintance with Wilde, he frequently saw Taylor, and the latter quite understood and was aware of the motive of the acquaintance. At the little College Street rooms he had frequently seen Wood, Atkins and Scaife, and he knew that these youths were in the same line at the same game as himself. In the August previous to this trial, he was at a certain house in Fitzroy Square. Orgies of the most disgraceful kind used to happen there. The police made a raid upon the premises, and he and the tailors were arrested. From that time he had ceased all relationship with the latter. Since that event he had enlisted, and while away in the country he was seen by someone representing Lord Queensbury and made a statement. The evidence of this witness created a great sensation in court, and it was increased when Sir Edward Clarke rose to cross-examine. This began after the adjournment. Sir Edward Clarke when were you seen in the country in reference to this case? Towards the end of March. Who saw you? Mr. Russell. Was there no examination before that? No. Did you state at Bow Street that you received thirty pounds not to say anything about a certain case? Yes. Now, I do not ask you to give me the name of the gentleman from whom this money was extorted, but I ask you to give me the name of the agents. Wood and Allen. Where were you living then? In Cranford Street. When did the incident occur in consequence of which you received that thirty pounds? About two weeks before. Where? At Camera Square. I'll leave that question. You say positively that Mr. Wilde committed sodomy with you at the Savoy? Yes. But you have been in the habit of accusing other gentlemen of the same offence? Never, unless it has been done. I submit that you blackmail gentlemen. No, sir. I have accepted money, but it has been offered to me to pay me for the offence. I have been solicited. I have never suggested this offence to gentlemen. Was the door locked during the time you described? I do not think so. It was late, and the prisoner told the waiter not to come up again. The next witness was William Parker. This youth corroborated his brother's evidence, he said he was present at the dinner with Taylor and Wilde described by the last witness. Wilde paid all his attention to his, witnesses, brother. He, Wilde, often fed his brother off his own fork or out of his own spoon. His brother accepted a preserved cherry from Wilde's own mouth. He took it into his, and this trick was repeated three or four times. His brother went off with the prisoner to his rooms at the Savoy, and the witness remained behind with Taylor, who said, Your brother is lucky. Oscar does not care what he pays, if he fancies a chap. Ellen Grant was the landlady of the house in Little College Street at which Taylor lodged. She gave evidence as to the visits of various lords, and stated that Wilde was a fairly frequent caller. He would remain for hours, and one of the lads was generally closeted with him. Once she tried the door and found it locked. She heard whispering and laughing, and her suspicions were aroused, though she did not like to take steps in the matter. Lucy Rumsby, who let a room to Charles Parker at Chelsea, gave rather similar evidence, but Wilde does not appear to have called there more than once, and that occasion it was to take out Parker, who went away with him. Sophia Gray, Taylor's landlady in Chapel Street, also gave evidence. She amused the court by the emphatic and outspoken way in which she explained that she had no idea of the nature of what was going on. Several young men were constantly calling upon Taylor and were alone with him for a long time, but he used to say that they were clerks for whom he hoped to find employment. The prisoner, Wilde, was a frequent visitor. But all this latter evidence paled as regards sinister significance beside that furnished by a young man named Alfred Wood. 
this young wretch admitted to acts of the grossest indecency with oscar wilde he said wilde saw his influence to induce me to consent he made me nearly drunk he used to put his hand inside my trousers beneath the table at dinner and compel me to do the same to him afterwards i used to lie on a sofa with him it was a long time however before i would allow him to actually do the act of sodomy he gave me money to go to america edward clark submitted this self-disgraced witness to a very vigorous cross-examination what have you been doing since your return from america well i have not done much have you done anything i have had no regular employment i thought not i could not get anything to do as a matter of fact you have had no respectable work for over three years well no did not you in conjunction with allen succeed in getting three hundred pounds from a gentleman yes but he was guilty with allen how much did you receive i advised allen how to proceed he gave me one hundred thirty pounds who else got any of this money parker charles parker got some and also wood thomas price was the next witness this man was a waiter at a private hotel in st james's and he testified to wilde's visits there and to the number of young men of quite inferior station who called to see him then came frank atkins whose evidence is given in full mr avery how old are you i am twenty years old what is your business i have been a billiard marker you are doing nothing now no who introduced you to wilde I was introduced to him by Schwabby in November 1892. Have you met Lord Alfred Douglas? I have. I dined with him in Wilde on several occasions. They pressed me to go to Paris. You went with them? Yes. You told Wilde on one occasion while in Paris that you had spent the previous night with a woman? No. I had arranged to meet a girl at the Moulin Rouge and Wilde told me not to go. However, I did go, but the woman was not there. You returned to London with Wilde? Yes. Did he give you money? He gave me a cigarette case. You were then the best of friends. He called me Fred and I addressed him as Oscar. We liked each other, but there was no harm in it. Did you visit Wilde on your return? Yes, at Tart Street. Wilde also called upon me in Oldenburg Street. On the latter occasion, one of the Parkers was present. You know most of these youths. Do you know Sidney Mavor? Only by sight. Sir Edward Clark. Were you ill at Osnaburg Street? Yes, I had the smallpox and was removed to the hospital ship. Before I went, I wrote to Parker asking him to write to Wilde and request him to come and save me, and he did so. You are sure you returned from Paris with Mr. Wilde? Yes. Did any impropriety ever take place between you and Wilde? Never. Have you ever lived with a man named Burton? Yes. What was he? A bookmaker. Have you and this Burton been engaging in the business of blackmailing? I have a professional name. I have sometimes called myself Denny. Has this man Burton, to your knowledge, obtained money from gentlemen by accusing them or threatening to accuse them of certain offences? Not to my knowledge. Not in respect to a certain Birmingham gentleman? No. That being your answer, I must particularise. On June ninth, 1891, did you and Burton obtain a large sum of money from a Birmingham gentleman? Certainly not. Then I ask you if in June 91 Burton did not take rooms for you in Thatchbrook Street? Yes, and he lived with me there. You were in the habit of taking men home with you then? Not for the purposes of blackmail. Well, for indecent purposes. No. Give me the name of two or three people whom you have taken home to that address. I cannot. I forget them. Now I am going to ask you a direct question, and I ask you to be careful in your reply. Were you and Burton ever taken to Rochester Road Police Station? No. Well, was Burton? I think not. At least he was not to my knowledge. Did the Birmingham gentleman give to Burton a cheque for two hundred pounds, drawn in the name of S. Dennis or Denny, your known name? Not to my knowledge. About two years ago, did you and someone else go to the Victoria Hotel, 
with two American gentlemen. No, I did not, never. I think you did. Be careful in your replies. Did Burton extort money from these gentlemen? I have never been there at all. Have you ever been to Anderton's hotel, and stayed at night with a gentleman, whom you threatened the next morning with exposure? I have not. When did you go abroad with Burton? I uh, think in February 1892. When did you last go with him abroad? Last spring. How long were you away? Oh, about a month. Where did you stay? We went to Nice and stayed at Geyser's Hotel. You were having a holiday? Yes. Which you continued with business in your usual way? The witness did not reply. What were you and Burton doing at Nice? Simply enjoying ourselves. During this visit of enjoyment you and Burton fell out, I think. Oh, dear no. Yet you separated from this Burton after that visit. I gave up being a bookmaker's clerk. What name did Burton use in the ring? Watson was his better name. Did you blackmail a gentleman at Nice? No. Are you sure there was no quarrel between you and Burton at Nice? There may have been a little one, but I don't remember anything of the kind. Mr. Grain then put some questions to the witness. Did you go to Scarborough about a year ago? Yes. Did Burton go with you? Yes. What was your business there? I was engaged professionally. I sang at the aquarium there. Did you get acquainted while there with a foreign gentleman? A count? Not acquainted. At this moment, Mr. Grain wrote a name on a piece of paper and handed it up to the witness, who read it. Do you know that gentleman? No. I heard his name mentioned at Scarborough. Then you never spoke to him? No. Was not a large sum, about five hundred pounds, paid to you or Burton by that gentleman about this time last year? No. Had you any engagement at the Scarborough Aquarium? Yes. How much did you receive a week? I was paid four pounds ten shillings. How long were you there? Three weeks. Have you ever lived in Buckingham Palace Road? I have. Mr. Grain wrote at this stage on another slip of paper, and it was handed up to the witness box. Look at that piece of paper. Do you know the name written there? I never saw it before. When were you living in Buckingham Palace Road? In 1992. Do you remember being introduced to an elderly man in the city? No. Did you take him to your room, permit him to commit sodomy with and upon you? Rob him of his pocketbook and threaten him with exposure if he complained? No! Did you threaten to extort money from him because he had agreed to accompany you home for a foul purpose? No. Did you ever stay at a place in the suburbs on the Southwestern Railway with Burton? No. What other addresses have you had in London during the last three years? None but those I've told you. This concluded the evidence of this witness for the time being. End of section 3 Section 4 Mary Applegate, employed as a housekeeper at Osnaburgh Street, said Atkins used to lodge there and left about a month ago. Wilde visited him at this house on two occasions that she was cognizant of. She stated that one of the housemaids came to her and complained of the state of the sheets of the bed in which Atkins slept after Wilde's first visit. The sheets were stained in a peculiar way. It may be explained here, in order to make the witness's evidence understood, that the sodomistic act has much the same effect as an enema inserted up the rectum. There is an almost immediate discharge, though not, of course, to the extent produced by the enema operation. The next witness called was Sidney Maver, a smooth-faced young fellow with dark hair and eyes. He stated that he was now in partnership with a friend in the city. He first made the acquaintance of the prisoner Taylor at the Gaiety Theatre in 1892. He afterwards visited him at Little College Street, Taylor was very civil and friendly, and introduced him to different people. The witness did not think at that time that Taylor had any ulterior designs. One day, however, Taylor said to him, 
I know a man in an influential position who could be of great use to you, Mavor. He likes young men when they are modest and nice in manners and appearance. I'll introduce you. It was arranged that they should dine at Kettner's restaurant the next evening. He called for Taylor, who said, I am glad you've made yourself pretty. Mr. Wilde likes nice, clean boys. That was the first time Wilde's name was mentioned. Arrived at the restaurant, they were shown into a private room. A man named Schwab and Wilde and another gentleman came in later. He believed the other gentleman to be Lord Alfred Douglas. The conversation at dinner was, the witness thought, peculiar, but he knew Wilde was a bohemian and he did not think the talk strange. He was placed next to Wilde, who used occasionally to pull his ear or chuck him under the chin, but he did nothing that was actually objectionable. He, Wilde, said to Taylor, Our little lad has pleasing manners. We must see more of him. Wilde took his address and the witness soon after received a silver cigarette case inscribed Sydney from O.W. October 1892. It was, said the innocent looking witness, quite a surprise to me. In the same month he received a letter making an appointment at the Albemarle Hotel and he went there and saw Wilde. The witness explained that after he saw Mr. Russell, the solicitor, on March 30th, he did not visit Taylor, nor did he receive a letter from Taylor. Sir Edward Clark. With regard to a certain dinner at which you were present, was the gentleman who gave the dinner of some social position? Witness. Yes. Mr. Grain. Taylor sent or gave you some checks, I believe? He did. Were they in payment of money you had advanced to him, merely? Yes. Mr. C. F. Gill. The gentleman of position who gave the dinner was quite a young man, was he not? Yes. Was Taylor and Wilde also present? Yes. In fact, it was their first meeting, was it not? So I understand. Maver being dismissed from the box, Edward Shelley was the next witness. He gave his age as 21, and said that in 1891 he was employed by a firm of publishers in Vigo Street. At that time, Wilde's books were being published by that firm. Wilde was in the habit of coming to the firm's place of business, and he seemed to take note of the witness, and generally stopped and spoke to him for a few moments. As Wilde was leaving Vigo Street one day, he invited him to dine with him at the Albemarle Hotel. The witness kept the appointment, he was proud of the invitation, and they dined together in a public room. Wilde was very kind and attentive, pressed witness to drink, said he could get him on, and finally invited him to go with him to Brighton, Cromer and Paris. The witness did not go. Wilde made him a present of a set of his writings, including the notorious and objectionable Dorian Gray. Wilde wrote something in the books. To one I like well. Or something to that effect. But the witness removed the pages bearing the inscription. He only did that after the decision in the Queensbury case. He was ashamed of the inscriptions and felt that they were open to misconception. His father objected to his friendship with Wilde. At first the witness thought that the latter was a kind of philanthropist, fond of youth and eager to be of assistance to young men of any promise. Certain speeches and actions on the part of Wilde caused him to alter this opinion. Pressed as to the nature of the actions he complained of, he said that Wilde once kissed him and put his arms round him. The witness objected vigorously, according to his own statement, and Wilde later said he was sorry and that he had drank too much wine. About two years ago, in 1893, he wrote a certain letter to Wilde. Sir Edward Clarke. On what subject? Witness. It was to break off the acquaintance. How did the letter begin? It began, Sir. Give me the gist of it. I believe I said I have suffered more from my acquaintance with you than you are ever likely to know of. I further said that he was an immoral man, and that I would never, if I could help it, see him again. 
Did you ever see him again after that? I did. Why did you go and dine with Mr. Wilde a second time? I suppose I was a young fool. I tried to think the best of him. You seem to have put a worse possible construction on his liking for you. Did your friendly relations with Mr. Wilde remain unbroken until the time you wrote that letter, in March 1893? Yes. Have you seen Mr. Wilde since then? Yes. After that letter? Yes. Where did you see him? I went to see him in Tite Street. Sir Edward Clarke then proceeded to question the witness with regard to letters which he had written to Wilde both before and after the visits to the Albemarle Hotel, and in the course of his replies the witness said that he formed the opinion that Wilde was really sorry for what he had done. What do you mean by what he had done? His improper behaviour with young men. Yet you say he never practised any actual improperties on you. Because he saw that I would never allow anything of the kind. He did not disguise from me what he wanted or what his usual customs with young men were. Yet you wrote him grateful letters breathing apparent friendship. For the reason I have given. Well, we'll leave that question. Now tell me, why did you leave the Vigo Street firm of publishers? Because it got to be known that I was friendly with Oscar Wilde. Did you leave the firm of your own accord? Yes. Why? People employed there, my fellow clerks, chaffed me about my acquaintance with Wilde. In what way? They implied scandalous things. They called me Mrs. Wilde and Miss Oscar. So you left? I resolved to put an end to an intolerable position. You were in bad odour at home too, I think? Yes, a little. I put it to you that your father requested you to leave his house? Yes. He strongly objected to my friendship with Wilde. You were uneasy in your mind as to Wilde's object? That is so. When did your mental balance, if I can put it so, recover itself? About October or November last. And have you remained well ever since? I think so. Yet I find that in January of this year you were in serious trouble. In what way? You were arrested for an assault upon your father. Yes, I was. Where were you taken? To the Fulham police station. You were offered bail? Yes. Did you send to Wilde and ask him to bail you out? Yes. What happened? In an hour my father went to the station and I was liberated. The witness now being released, the previous witness, Atkins, was recalled, and a very sensational incident arose. During the luncheon interval... Mr. Robert Humphreys, Wilde's solicitor, had been busy. Not satisfied with Atkins's replies to the questions put to him in cross-examination, he had searched the records at Scotland Yard and Rochester Road, and made some startling discoveries. A folded document was handed up to the judge. Mr. Justice Charles, who read it at once, assumed a severe expression. The document was understood to be a copy of a record from Rochester Road. Atkins, looking very sheepish and uncomfortable, re-entered the witness box, and the court prepared itself for some startling disclosures. Now, I warn you to attend and to be very careful. I am going to ask you a question. Think before you reply. Just be careful now, Atkins. On June 10th, 1891, you were living at Thatchbrook Street... Yes. In Pimlico? Yes. James Burton was living there with you? He was. Were you both taken by two constables, 396A and 500A, you may have forgotten the officer's numbers, to Rochester Road Police Station, and charged with demanding money from a gentleman with menaces? You had threatened to accuse him of a disgusting offence. I was not charged with that. Were you taken to the police station? Yes. You and Burton? Yes. What were you charged with? With striking a gentleman. In what place was it alleged this happened? At the card table. In your own room at Thatchbrook Street? Yes. What was the name of the gentleman? I don't know. How long had you known him? Only that night. Where had you met him? At the Allen Bra. Had you seen him before that time? Not to speak to. Meeting him at the Alhambra, did he accompany you to Thatchbrook Street? Yes, to play cards. Not to accuse him, 
when there, of attempting to indecently handle you? No. Was Burton there? Yes. Anyone else? I don't think so. Was the gentleman sober? Oh, yes. What room did you go into? The sitting room. Who called the police? I don't know. The landlady, perhaps? I believe she did. Did the landlady give you and Burton into custody? No, nobody did. Some person must have done. Who did? All I can say is I did not hear anybody. At any rate, you were taken to Rochester Road, and a gentleman went with you. Yes. Police Constable 396A was here called into court, and took up a position close to the witness box. He gazed curiously at Atkins, who wriggled about and eyed him uneasily. Now I ask you in the presence of this officer, was the statement made at the police station that you and the gentleman had been in bed together? I don't think so. Think before you speak. It will be better for you. Did not the landlady actually come into the room and see you and the gentleman naked on or in the bed together? I don't remember that she did. You may as well tell me about it. You know. Was that statement made? Well, yes, it was. You had endeavoured to force money out of this gentleman. I asked him for some money. At the police station the gentleman refused to prosecute. Yes. So you and Burton were liberated? Yes. About two hours ago, Askins, I asked you these very questions, and you swore upon your oath that you had not been in custody at all, and had never been taken to Rochester Road Police Station. How came you to tell me those lies? I did not remember it. Atkins looked somewhat crestfallen and abashed, yet some of his former brazen impudence still gleamed upon his now scarlet face. He heaved a deep sigh of relief when told to leave the court by the judge, who pointed sternly to the doorway. Of all the creatures associated with Wilde in these affairs, this Atkins was the lowest and most contemptible. For some years he had been in the habit of blackmailing men whom he knew to be inclined to perverted sexual vices, and his was a well-known figure up west. He constantly frequented the promenades of the music halls. He made up his eyes and lips, wore corsets and affected an effeminate air. He was an infallible judge of the class of man he wished to meet, and rarely made a mistake. He would follow a likely subject about, stumble against him as though by accident, and make an elaborate apology in mincing female tones. Once in conversation with his mark, he speedily contrived to make the latter aware that he did not object to certain proposals. He invariably permitted the beastly act before attempting blackmail, partly because it afforded him a stronger hold over his victim, and partly because he rejoiced in the disgusting thing for its own sake. He was the butt of the ladies of the pavement round Piccadilly Circus, who used to shout after him, inquire sarcastically, if he had got off last night, and if his toff hadn't bilked him. He would affect to laugh and pass the thing off with a joke, but to his intimates he assumed a great loathing for women of this class, whom he appeared to regard as dangerous obstacles to the exercise of his own foul trade. On several occasions he was assaulted by these women. End of section 4 Section 5 To return to the trial of Wilde and Taylor. As soon as the inquiry was resumed, Mr Charles Matthews went down into the cells and had an interview with the prisoner Wilde and on his return entered into serious consultation with his leader, Sir Edward Clarke. In the meanwhile, Taylor conversed with his counsel, Mr Grain, across the rail of the dock. It was felt that an important announcement bearing on the conduct of the case was likely to be made. It came from Mr Gill, representing the prosecution. As soon as Mr Justice Charles had taken his seat, the prosecuting counsel rose and said that having considered the indictment, he had decided not to ask for a verdict in the two counts charging the prisoners with conspiracy. 
subdued expressions of surprise were audible from the public gallery when mr gill delivered himself of this dramatic announcement and the sensation was strengthened a little later when sir edward clarke informed the jury that both the prisoners desired to give evidence and would be called as witnesses these matters having been determined upon sir edward clarke rose and proceeded to make some severe criticisms upon the conduct of the prosecution in what he referred to as the literary part of the case hidden meanings he said had been most unjustly read into the poetical and prose works of his client and it seemed that an endeavour though a futile one was to be made to convict mr wilde because of a prurient construction which had been placed by his enemies upon certain of his works he alluded particularly to dorian gray which was an allegory pure and simple according to the rather musty and far-fetched notions of the prosecution it was an impure and simple allegory but wilde could not fairly be judged he said by the standards of other men for he was a literary eccentric though intellectually a giant and he did not profess to be guided by the same sentiments as animated other and less highly endowed men he then called mr wilde the prisoner rose with seeming alacrity from his place in the dock walked with a firm tread and dignified demeanour to the witness-box and leaning across the rail in the same easy and not ungraceful attitude that he assumed when examined by mr carson in the libel action prepared to answer the questions addressed to him by his counsel wilde was first interrogated as to his previous career in the year eighteen eighty four he had married a miss lloyd and from that time to the present he had continued to live with his wife at sixteen tite street chelsea he also occupied rooms in st james's place which were rented for the purposes of his literary labours as it was quite impossible to secure quiet and mental repose at his own house when his two young sons were at home he had heard the evidence in this case against himself and asserted that there was no shadow of a foundation for the charges of indecent behaviour alleged against himself mr gill then rose to cross-examine and the court at once became on the qui vive wilde seemed perfectly calm and did not change his attitude or tone of polite deprecation mr gill you are acquainted with the publication entitled the chameleon witness very well indeed contributors to that journal are friends of yours that is so i believe that lord alfred douglas was a frequent contributor hardly that i think he wrote some verses occasionally for the chameleon and indeed for other papers the poems in question were somewhat peculiar they certainly were not mere commonplaces like so much that is labelled poetry the tone of them met with your critical approval it was not for me to approve or disapprove i leave that to the reviews at the trial queensbury and wilde you described them as beautiful poems i said something tantamount to that the verses were original in theme and construction and i admired them in one of the sonnets by lord a douglas a peculiar use is made of the word shame i have noticed the line you refer to what significance would you attach to the use of that word in connection with the idea of the poem i can hardly take it upon myself to explain the thoughts of another man you were remarkably friendly with the author perhaps he vouchsafed you an explanation on one occasion he did i should like to hear it lord alfred explained that the word shame was used in the sense of modesty i e to feel shame or not to feel shame you can perhaps understand that such verses as these would not be acceptable to the reader with an ordinarily balanced mind i'm not prepared to say it appears to me to be a question of taste temperament and individuality i should say that one man's poetry is another man's poison loud laughter i dare say there is another sonnet what construction can be put on the line i am the love that dare not speak its name i think the writer's meaning is quite unambiguous 
the love he alluded to was that between an elder and younger man as between david and jonathan such love as plato made the basis of his philosophy such as was sung in the sonnets of shakespeare and michelangelo that deep spiritual affection that was as pure as it was perfect it pervaded great works of art like those of michelangelo and shakespeare such as passeth the love of woman it was beautiful it was pure it was noble it was intellectual this love of an elder man with his experience of life and the younger with all the joy and hope of life before him the witness made this speech with great emphasis and some signs of emotion and there came from the gallery at its conclusion a medley of applause and hisses which his lordship at once ordered to be suppressed i wish to call your attention to the style of your correspondence with lord a douglas i am ready i am never ashamed of the style of any of my writings you are fortunate or shall i say shameless i refer to passages in two letters in particular kindly quote them in letter number one you use this expression your slim gilt soul and you refer to lord alfred's rose-leaf lips the letter is really a sort of prose sonnet in answer to an acknowledgment of one i had received from lord alfred do you think that an ordinarily constituted being would address such expressions to a younger man i'm not happily i think an ordinarily constituted being it is agreeable to be able to agree with you mr wilde laughter there is i assure you nothing in either letter of which i need to be ashamed you have heard the evidence of the lad charles parker yes of atkins yes of shelley yes and these witnesses have you say lied throughout their evidence as to my association with them as to the dinners taking place and the small presents i gave them is mostly true but there is not a particle of truth in that part of the evidence which alleged improper behaviour why did you take up with these youths i am a lover of youth laughter you exalt youth as a sort of god i like to study the young in everything there is something fascinating in youthfulness so you would prefer puppies to dogs and kittens to cats laughter i think so i should enjoy for instance the society of a beardless briefless barrister quite as much as that of the most accomplished q c loud laughter i hope the former whom i represent in large numbers will appreciate the compliment more laughter these youths were much inferior to you in station i never inquired nor did i care what station they occupied i found them for the most part bright and entertaining i found their conversation a change it acted as a kind of mental tonic you saw nothing peculiar or suggestive in the arrangement of taylor's rooms i cannot say that i did they were bohemian that is all i have seen stranger rooms you never suspected the relations that might exist between taylor and his young friends i had no need to suspect anything taylor's relations with his friends appear to me to be quite normal you have attended to the evidence of the witness mavor i have is it true or false it is mainly true but false inferences have been drawn from it as from most of the evidence truth may be found i believe at the bottom of a well it is apparently difficult to find it in a court of law laughter nevertheless we endeavour to extract it did the witness mavor write you expressing a wish to break off the acquaintance i received a rather unaccountable and impertinent letter from him for which he afterwards expressed great regret why should he have written it if your conduct had been altogether blameless i do not profess to be able to explain the motives of most of the witnesses mavor may have been told some falsehood about me his father was greatly incensed at his conduct at this time and i believe attributed his son's erratic courses to his friendship with me i do not think mavor altogether to blame pressure was brought to bear upon him and he was not then quite right in his mind you made handsome presents to these young fellows pardon me 
I differ. I gave two or three of them a cigarette case. Boys of that class smoke a good deal of cigarettes. I have a weakness for presenting my acquaintances with cigarette cases. Rather an expensive habit, if indulged in indiscriminately. Less extravagant than giving dueled garters to ladies? Laughter. When a few more unimportant questions had been asked, Wilde left the witness box, returning to the dock with the same air of what might be described as serious easiness. The impression created by his replies was not, upon the whole, favourable to his cause. His place was taken by the prisoner Taylor. He said that he was thirty-three years of age and was educated at Marlborough. When he was twenty-one, he came into forty-five thousand pounds. In a few years he ran through this fortune, and at about the time he went to Chapel Street, he was made a bankrupt. The charges made against him of misconduct were entirely unfounded. He was asked point-blank if he had not been given to sodomy from his early youth, and if he had not been expelled from a public school for being caught in a compromising situation with a small boy in the lavatory. Taylor was also asked if he had not actually obtained a living since his bankruptcy by procuring lads and young men for rich gentlemen, whom he knew to be given to this vice. He was also asked if he had not extracted large sums of money from wealthy men by threatening to accuse them of immoralities, to all these plain questions he returned in direct answer, No. After the luncheon interval, Sir Edward Clarke rose to address the jury in defence of Oscar Wilde. He began by carefully analysing the evidence. He declared that the wretches who had come forward to admit their own disgrace were shameless creatures incapable of one manly thought or one manly action. They were, without exception, blackmailers. They lived by luring men to their rooms, generally on the pretense that a beautiful girl would be provided for them on their arrival. Once in their clutches, these victims could only get away by paying a large sum of money unless they were prepared to face and deny the most disgraceful charges. Innocent men constantly paid, rather than face the odium attached to the breath even of such scandals. They had, moreover, wives and children, daughters, maybe, or a sister whose honour or name they were obliged to consider. Therefore they usually submitted to be fleeced, and in this way this wretched Wood and the abject Atkins had been able to go about the West End well fed and well dressed. These youths had been introduced to Wilde. They were pleasant spoken enough, and outwardly decent in their language and conduct. Wilde was taken in by them and permitted himself to enjoy their society. He did not defend Wilde for this, he had unquestionably shown imprudence, but a man of his temperament could not be judged by the standards of the average individual. These youths had come forward to make these charges in a conspiracy to ruin his client. Was it likely, he asked, that a man of Wilde's cleverness would put himself so completely in the power of these harpies as he would be if guilty of only a tenth of the enormities they alleged against him? If Wilde practised these acts so openly and so flagrantly, if he allowed the facts to come to the knowledge of so many, then he was a fool who was not fit to be at large. If the evidence was to be credited, these acts of gross indecency, which culminated in actual crime, were done in so open a manner as to compel the intention of landladies and housemaids. He was not himself, and he thanked heaven for it, versed in the acts of those who committed these crimes against nature. He did not know under what circumstances they could be practised, but he believed that this was a vice which, because of the horror and repulsion it excited, because of the fury it provoked against those guilty of it, was conducted with the utmost possible secrecy. He respectfully submitted that no jury could find a man guilty on the evidence of these tainted witnesses. Take the testimony, he said, of Atkins. This young man had denied that he had ever been charged at a police station with alleging blackmail, yet he was able to prove that he had grossly perjured himself in this and other directions. That was a sample of evidence, and Atkins was a type of the witnesses. The only one of these youths who had ever attempted to get a decent living 
or who was not an experienced blackmailer, was Maver, and he had denied that Wilde had ever been guilty of any impropriety with him. The prosecution had sought to make capital out of two letters written by Wilde to Lord Alfred Douglas. He pointed out a fact which was of considerable importance, namely, that Wilde had produced one of these letters himself. Was that the act of a man who had reason to fear the contents of a letter being known? Wilde never made any secret of visiting Taylor's rooms. He found there society which afforded him variety and change. Wilde made no secret of giving dinners to some of the witnesses. He thought that they were poorly off, and that a good dinner at a restaurant did not often come their way. On only one occasion did he hire a private room. The dinners were perfectly open and above board. Wilde was an extraordinary man, and he had written letters which might seem high-flown, extravagant, exaggerated, absurd if they liked, but he was not afraid or ashamed to produce these letters. The witnesses Charles Parker, Alfred Wood and Atkins had been proved to have previously been guilty of blackmailing of this kind, and upon their uncorroborated evidence surely the jury would not convict the prisoner on such terrible charges. Fix your minds, concluded Sir Edward earnestly, firmly on the tests that ought to be applied to the evidence as a whole, before you can condemn a fellow man to a charge like this. Remember all that this charge implied, of implicable ruin and inevitable disgrace. Then I trust that the result of your deliberations will be to gratify those thousand hopes that are waiting upon your verdict. I trust that verdict will clear from this fearful imputation one of the most accomplished and renowned men of letters of today. At the end of this peroration, there was some slight applause at the back of the court, but it was hushed almost at once. Wilde had paid great attention to the speech on his behalf, and on one or two occasions had pressed his hands to his eyes as if expressing some not unnatural emotion. The speech concluded, however, he resumed his customary attitude, and awaited with apparent firmness all that might befall. Mr. Grain then rose to address the jury on behalf of Taylor, he submitted that there was really no case against his client. An endeavour had been made to prove that Taylor was in the habit of introducing to Wilde youths whom he knew to be amenable to the practices of the latter, and that he got paid for this degrading work. The attempt to establish this disgusting association between Taylor and Wilde had completely broken down. He was, it was true, acquainted with Parker, Wood and Atkins, he had seen them constantly in restaurants and music halls, and they had at first forced themselves upon his notice, and thus got acquainted with a man whom they designed for blackmail. All the resources of the Crown had been unable to produce any corroboration of the charges made by these witnesses. How had Taylor got his livelihood, it might be asked? He was perfectly prepared to answer the question. He had been living on an allowance made him by members of his late father's firm, a firm with which all their present were familiar. Was it in the least degree likely that such scenes as the witnesses described, with such apparent candour and such wealth of filthy detail, could have taken place in Taylor's own apartments? It was incredible that a man could thus risk almost certain discovery. In conclusion, he confidently looked for the acquittal of his client, who was guilty of nothing more than having made imprudent acquaintances and having trusted too much to the descriptions of themselves given by others mr gill then replied for the prosecution in a closely reasoned and most able speech which occupied two hours in delivery and which created an enormous impression in the crowded court he commented at great length upon the evidence he contended that in a case of this description corroboration was of comparatively minor importance for it was not in the least likely that acts of the kind alleged would be practised before a third party who might afterwards swear to the fact therefore when the witnesses described what had transpired when they and the prisoners were alone he did not think that corroboration could possibly be given there was not likely to be an eye-witness of the facts but in respect to many things, he declared the evidence was corroborated. Whatever the character of these youths might be, they had given evidence as to certain facts, and no cross-examination, however adroit, 
however vigorous had shaken their testimony or caused them to waver about that which was evidently firmly implanted in their memories a man might conceivably come forward and commit perjury but these youths were accusing themselves in accusing another of shameful and infamous acts and this they would hardly do if it were not the truth wilde had made presents to these youths and it was noticeable that the gifts were invariably made after he had been alone at some rooms or other with one another of the lads in the circumstances even a silver cigarette case was corroboration his learned friend had protested against any evil construction being placed upon these gifts and these dinners but in the name of common sense what other construction was possible when they heard of a man like wilde presumably of refined and cultured tastes who might if he wished enjoy the society of the best and most cultivated men and women in london accompanying to nice and other places on the continent uninformed unintellectual and vulgar ill-bred youths of the type of charles parker then in heaven's name what were they to think all those visits all those dinners all those gifts were corroboration they served to confirm the truth of the statements made by the youths who confessed to the commission of acts for which the things he had quoted were positive and actual payment in the case of the witness sidney mavor it was clear that wilde had in some way continued to disgust this youth some acts of wilde either towards himself or towards others had offended him was not the letter which mavor had addressed to the prisoner desiring the cessation of their friendship corroboration at this moment his lordship interposed and said that although the evidence of this witness was clearly of importance he had denied that he had been guilty of impropriety and he did not think the count in reference to maver could stand after some discussion this count was struck out of the indictment before concluding mr gill stated that he had withdrawn the conspiracy count to prevent any embarrassment to sir edward clarke who had complained that he was affected in his defence by the counts being joined mr gill said in conclusion that it was the duty of the jury to express their verdict without fear or favour they owed a duty to society however sorry they might feel themselves at the moral downfall of an eminent man to protect society from such scandals by removing from its heart a sore which could not fail in time to corrupt and taint it all mr justice charles then commenced his summing up his lordship at the outset said he thought mr gill had taken a wise course in withdrawing the conspiracy counts and thus relieving them all of an embarrassing position he did not see why the conspiracy counts need have been inserted at all and he should direct the jury to return a verdict of acquittal on those charges as well as upon one other count against taylor to which he would further allude and upon which no sufficient evidence had been given he the learned judge asked the jury to apply their minds solely to the evidence which had been given any preconceived notion which they might have formed from reading about the case he urged them to dismiss from their minds and to deal with the case as it had been presented to them by the witnesses his lordship went on to ask the jury not to attach too much importance to the uncorroborated evidence of accomplices in such cases as these had there been no corroboration in this case it would have been his duty to instruct the jury accordingly but he was clearly of opinion that there was corroboration to all the witnesses not it is true the conspiracy testimony of eyewitnesses but corroboration of the narrative generally three of the witnesses charles parker wood and atkins were not only accomplices but they had been properly described by sir edward clarke as persons of bad character atkins out of his own mouth was convicted of having told the most gross and deliberate falsehoods the jury knew how this matter came before them as the outcome of the trial of lord queensbury for alleged libel the learned judge proceeded to outline the features of the queensbury trial commenting most upon what was called the literary part of wilde's examination in that case the judge said that he had not read dorian gray but extracts were read at the former trial and the present jury had a general idea of the story he did not think they ought to base any unfavourable inference upon the fact that wilde was the author of that work 
it would not be fair to do so for while it was true that there were many great writers such for instance as sir walter scott and charles dickens who never penned an offensive line there were other great authors whose pens dealt with subjects not so innocent as for wilde's aphorisms in the chameleon some were amusing some were cynical and some were if he might be allowed to say so simple but there was nothing in per se to convict wilde of indecent practices however the same paper contained a very indecent contribution the priest and the acolyte mr wilde had nothing to do with that in the chameleon also appeared two poems by lord alfred douglas one called in praise of shame and the other called two loves it was said that these sonnets had an immoral tendency and that wilde approved them he was examined at great length about these sonnets and was also asked about the two letters written by him to lord alfred douglas letters that had been written before the publication of the above-mentioned poems in the previous case mr carson had insisted that these letters were indecent on the other hand wilde had told them that he was not ashamed of them as they were intended in the nature of prose poems and breathed the pure love of one man for another such a love as david had for jonathan and such as plato described as the beginning of wisdom he would next deal with the actual charges and would first call their attention to the offence alleged to have been committed with edward shelley at the beginning of eighteen ninety two shelley was undoubtedly in the position of an accomplice but his evidence was corroborated he was not however tainted with the offences with which parker wood and atkins were connected he seemed to be a person of some education and a fondness for literature as to shelley's visit to the albemarle hotel the jury were the best judges of the demeanour of the witness wilde denied all the allegations of indecency though he admitted the other parts of the young man's story his lordship called attention to the letters written by shelley to wilde in eighteen ninety two eighteen ninety three and eighteen ninety four it was he said a very anxious part of the jury's task to account for the tone of these letters and for shelley's conduct generally it became a question as to whether or no his mind was disordered he felt bound to say that though there was evidence of great excitability to talk of either shelley or maver as an insane youth was an exaggeration but it would be for the jury to draw their own conclusions passing to the case of atkins the judge drew attention to his meeting with taylor in november eighteen ninety two to the dinner at the cafe florence at which wilde taylor atkins and lord a douglas were present and to the visit of atkins to paris in company with wilde after dwelling on the circumstances of that visit his lordship referred to wilde's two visits to atkins in osnaburgh street in december eighteen ninety three wilde explained the paris visit by saying that schweber had arranged to take atkins to paris but being unable to leave at the time appointed he asked wilde to take charge of the youth and he did so out of friendship for schweber wilde further denied that he was much in atkins company when in paris atkins certainly was an unreliable witness and had obviously given an incorrect version of his relations with burton he told the grossest falsehoods with regard to their arrest and was convicted out of his own mouth when recalled by sir e clark it was for the jury to decide how much of atkins evidence they might safely believe then there were the events described as having occurred at the savoy hotel in march eighteen ninety two he would ask the jury to be careful in the evidence of the chambermaid jane cotter and the interpretation they put upon it if her evidence and that of the monsieur midgey were true then wilde's evidence on that part of the case was untrue and the jury must use their own discretion he did not wish to enlarge upon this most unpleasant part of the whole unpleasant case 
but it was necessary to remind the jury as discreetly as he could that the chambermaid had objected to making the bed on several occasions after wilde and atkins had been in the bedroom alone together there were she had affirmed indications on the sheets that conduct of the grossest kind had been indulged in he thought it his duty to remind the jury that there might be an innocent explanation of these stains though the evidence of jane cotter certainly afforded a kind of corroboration of these charges and of atkins's own story in reference to the case of wood he contrasted wood's account with that of wilde it seemed that lord alfred douglas had met wood at taylor's rooms in response to a telegram from the former wood went to the cafe royale and there met wilde for the first time wilde speaking first on the other hand wilde represented that wood spoke first the jury might think that in any case the circumstances of that meeting were remarkable especially when taken in conjunction with what followed there was no doubt that wood had fallen into evil courses and he and alan had extracted the sum of three hundred pounds in blackmail the interview between wilde and wood prior to the latter's departure for america was remarkable a sum of money said to be thirty pounds was given by wilde to wood and wood returned some of wilde's letters that had somehow come into his possession wood however kept back one letter which got into alan's possession wood got five pounds more on the following day went to america and while there wrote to taylor a letter in which occurred the passage tell oscar if he likes he can send me a draft for an easter egg it would be for the jury to consider what would have been the inner meaning of these and other transactions as to the prisoner taylor he had on his own admission led a life of idleness and got through a fortune of forty five thousand pounds it was alleged that the prisoner had virtually turned his apartments into a bagno or brothel in which young men took the place of prostitutes and that his character in this regard was well known to those who were secretly given to this particular vice one of the offences imputed to taylor had reference to charles parker who had spoken of the peculiar arrangement of the rooms there were two bedrooms in the inner room with folding doors between and the windows were heavily draped so that no one from the opposite houses could possibly see what was going on inside heavy curtains it was said hung before all the doors so that it could not be possible for an eavesdropper to hear what was proceeding inside there was a curiously shaped sofa in the sitting-room and the whole aspect of the room resembled it was asserted a fashionable resort for vice wilde was undoubtedly present at some of the tea parties given there and did not profess to be surprised at what he saw there it had been shown that both the parkers went to these rooms and further that charles parker had received thirty pounds of the blackmail extorted by wood and allen charles parker's evidence was therefore doubly tainted like that of wood and atkins but his evidence was to some extent confirmed by that of his brother william some parts of charles parker's evidence were also corroborated by other witnesses as for instance by marjorie bancroft who swore that she saw wilde visit charles parker's rooms in park walk it was admitted that this parker visited wilde at st james's place charles parker had been arrested with taylor in the fitzroy square raid and this went to show that they were in the habit of associating with those suspected of offences of the kind alleged both however were on that occasion discharged and parker enlisted in the army it was quite manifest that charles parker was of a low class of morality that concluded the various charges made in this case and he had very little to add maver's evidence had little or no value with reference to the issues now before the jury except as showing how he became acquainted with wilde and taylor so far as it went maver's evidence was rather in favour of wilde than otherwise and nothing indecent had been proved against that witness 
in conclusion his lordship submitted the case to the jury in the confident hope that they would do justice to themselves on the one hand and to the two defendants on the other the learned judge concluded by further directing the jury as to the issues and asked them to form their opinions on the evidence and to give the case their careful consideration the judge left the following questions to the jury first whether wilde committed certain offences with shelley wood with a person or persons unknown at the savoy hotel or with charles parker secondly whether taylor procured the commission of those acts or any of them thirdly did wilde or taylor or either of them attempt to get atkins to commit certain offences with wilde and fourthly did taylor commit certain acts with either charles parker or wood the jury retired at one thirty five the summing up of the judge having taken exactly three hours at three o'clock a communication was brought from the jury and conveyed by the clerk of arraigns to the judge and shortly afterwards the jury had luncheon taken into them at four fifteen the judge sent for the clerk of arraigns mr avery who proceeded to his lordship's private room subsequently mr avery went to the jury apparently with a communication from the judge and returned in a few minutes to the judge's private room shortly before five o'clock the usher brought a telegram from one of the jurors and after it had been shown to the clerk of arraigns it was allowed to be dispatched eventually the jury returned into court at a quarter past five o'clock the verdict the judge i have received a communication from you to the effect that you are unable to arrive at an agreement now is there anything you desire to ask me in reference to the case the foreman i have put that question to my fellow jurymen my lord and i do not think there is any doubt that we cannot agree upon three of the questions i find from the entry which you have written against the various subdivisions of number one that you cannot agree as to any of those subdivisions that is so my lord is there no prospect of an agreement if you retire to your room i fear not you have not been inconvenienced i ordered what you required and there is no prospect that with a little more deliberation you may come to an agreement as to some of them my fellow jurymen say there is no possibility i am very unwilling to prejudice your deliberations and i have no doubt that you have done your best to arrive at an agreement on the other hand i would point out to you that the inconveniences of a new trial are very great if you thought that by deliberating a reasonable time you could arrive at a conclusion upon any of the questions i have asked you i would ask you to do so we considered the matter before coming into court and i do not think there is any chance of agreement we have considered it again and again if you tell me that i do not think i am justified in detaining you any longer sir edward clark i wish to ask my lord that a verdict may be given in the conspiracy counts mr gill i wish to oppose that i directed the acquittal of the prisoners on the conspiracy counts this morning i thought that was the right course to adopt and the same remark might be made with regard to the two counts in which taylor was charged with improper conduct towards wood and parker it was unfortunate that the real and material questions which had occupied the jury's attention for such a length of time were matters upon which the jury were unable to agree upon these matters and upon the counts which were concerned with them i must discharge the jury i wish to apply for bail then for mr wilde mr hall and i make the same application on behalf of taylor i don't feel able to accede to the applications I shall probably renew the application, my lord. That would be to a judge in chambers. The case will assuredly be tried again, and probably it will go to the next sessions. The two prisoners, who had listened to all this very attentively, were then conducted from the dock, 
wilde had listened to the foreman of the jury's statement without any show of feeling it was stated that the failure of the jury to agree upon a verdict was owing to three out of the twelve being unable upon the evidence placed before them to arrive at any other conclusion than that of not guilty the following day mr baron pollock decided that oscar wilde should be allowed out on bail in his own recognizances of two thousand five hundred pounds and two sureties of one thousand two hundred and fifty pounds each wilde was brought up at bow street next day and the sureties attended after a further application bail in his case was granted and he went out of prison for the present a free man but with nemesis in the shape of the second trial awaiting him end of section five section six the second trial of oscar wilde with its dramatic finale for no one thought much of its consequences to alfred taylor came on in the third week of may at the old bailey it was agreed to take the cases of the prisoners separately taylor's first sir edward clark who still represented wilde stated that he should make an application at the end of taylor's trial that wilde's case should stand over till the next sessions his lordship said that the application had better be postponed till the end of the first trial significantly adding if there should be an acquittal so much the better for the other prisoner meanwhile wilde was to be released on bail sir francis lockwood who now represented the prosecution then went over all the details of the intimacy of the parkers and wood with taylor and wilde and called charles parker who repeated his former evidence including a very serious allegation against the prisoner he stated in so many words that taylor had kept him at his rooms for a whole week during which time they rarely went out and had repeatedly committed sodomy with him the witness unblushingly asserted that they slept together and that taylor called him darling and referred to him as my little wife when he left taylor's rooms the latter paid him some money said he should never want for cash and that he would introduce him to men prepared to pay for that kind of thing cross-examined charles parker admitted that he had previously been guilty of this offence but had determined never to submit to such treatment again taylor over persuaded him he was nearly drunk and incapable the first time of making a moral resistance alfred wood also described his acquaintance with taylor and his visits to what he termed the snuggery at little college street but which quite as appropriately could have been designed by a name which would have the additional merit of strictly describing it and of rhyming with it at the same time it was not at all clear however that taylor was responsible at least directly for the introduction of alfred wood to wilde as the indictment suggested this was effected by a third person whose name had not as yet been introduced into the case mrs grant the landlady at thirteen little college street described taylor's rooms she was not aware she said that they were put to an improper use but she had remarked to her husband the care taken that whatever went on there should be hidden from the eyes and ears of others young men used to come there and remain some time with taylor and wilde was a frequent visitor taylor provided much of his own bed linen and she noticed that the pillows had lace and were generally elaborate and costly the prosecution next called a new witness emily becker chambermaid at the savoy hotel who stated that she had complained to the management of the state in which she found the bed linen and the utensils of the room when pressed for particulars the witness hesitated and after stating that she refused to make the bed or empty the chamber she said she handed in her notice but was prevailed upon to withdraw it then by a series of adroit questions counsel obtained the particulars the bed linen was stained the colour was brown 
the towels were similarly discoloured one of the pillows was marked with face powder there was excrement in one of the utensils in the bedroom wilde had handed her half a sovereign but when she saw the state of the room after he had gone she gave the coin to the management evidence with regard to wilde's rooms at st james's place was given by thomas price who was able to identify taylor as one of the callers mrs gray no relation happily to the notorious dorian of three chapel street chelsea deposed that taylor stayed at her house from august eighteen ninety three to the end of that year formal and minor items of evidence concluded the case for the prosecution of taylor and mr grain proceeded to open his defence by calling the prisoner into the witness box mr grain examined him what is your age i am thirty-three you were the son of the late henry taylor who was a manufacturer of an article of food in large demand i am were you at marlborough school till i was seventeen you inherited forty five thousand pounds i believe yes and spent it it went since then you have had no occupation i have lived upon an allowance made me is there any truth in the evidence of charles parker that you misconducted yourself with him not the slightest what rooms had you at little college street one bedroom but it was subdivided and i believe there was generally a bed in each division you had a good many visitors oh yes did charles maver stay with you then yes about a week when when I first went there in 1892. What is his age? He is now 26 or 27. Do you remember going through a form of marriage with Maver? No, never. Did you tell Parker you did? Nothing of the kind. Did you not place a wedding ring on his finger and go to bed with him that night as though he were your lawful wife? it is all false i deny it all did you ever sleep with maver i think i did the first night after he had a separate bed did you induce maver to attire himself as a woman certainly i did not but there were articles of women's dress at your rooms no there was a fancy dress for a female a theatrical costume was it made for a woman i think so perhaps you wore it i put it on once by way of a lark on no other occasion i wore it once too at a fancy dress ball i suggest that you often dressed as a woman no you wore and caused maver afterwards to wear lace drawers a woman's garment with the dress I wore knickerbockers and stockings when I wore it at the fancy dress ball. And a woman's wig, which afterwards did for Maver? No, the wig was made for me. I was going to a fancy ball as Dick Whittington. Who introduced you to the Parkers? A friend named Harrington at the St. James restaurant. You invited them to your rooms? I did. Why? I found them very nice. You were acquainted with a young fellow named Mason? Yes. He visited you? Two or three times only, I think. Did you induce him to commit a filthy act with you? Never. He has written you letters? That's very likely. The Solicitor General proposes to read one. The letter was as follows. Dear Alf, let me have some money as soon as you can. I would not ask you for it if I could get any myself. You know the business is not so easy. There is a lot of trouble attached to it. Come home soon, dear, and let us go out together sometimes. Have very little news. Going to a dinner on Monday and a theatre tonight. With much love, yours always, Charles. I ask you, Taylor, for an explanation, for it requires one, of the use of the words come home soon dear 
as between two men. <laughs> I do not see anything in it. Nothing in it? Well, I am not responsible for the expressions of another. You allowed yourself to be addressed in this strain. It's the way you read it. The summing up followed, and after a consultation of three quarters of an hour, the jury returned a verdict against Taylor on the indecency counts, not agreeing, however, as to the charges of procuration. Sentence was postponed, pending the result of the trial of Oscar Wilde, which began next day. End of section 6 Section 7 Wilde had, meanwhile, been at large on bail. The one charge of conspiring with Alfred Taylor to procure had been dropped, and the indictment of misdemeanour alleged that the prisoner unlawfully committed various acts with Charles Parker, Alfred Wood, Edward Shelley, and certain persons unknown. The plea of not guilty was recorded. The case for the prosecution was opened by calling Edward Shelley, the young man who had been employed by the Vigo Street publishers. Shelley repeated the story of the beginning and the progress of his intimacy with Wilde. It began, he said, in 1891. In March 1893, they quarrelled. The witness had been subjected by the prisoner to attempts at improper conduct. Oscar had, to be plain, on several occasions, placed his hand on the private parts of the witness, and sought to put his, witnesses, hand in the same indelicate position as regards Wilde's own person. Witness resented these acts at the time, had told Wilde not to be a beast, and the latter expressed his sorrow. But I am so fond of you, Edward, he had said. The witness wrote Wilde that he would not see him again. He spoke in the letter of these and other acts of impropriety, and made use of the expression... I was entrapped. Witness explained to the court. He knew I admired him very much, and he took advantage of me, of my admiration, and, well, I won't say innocence. I don't know what to call it. These are some of the letters which Shelley wrote to Wilde. October 27th, 1892. Oscar, will you be at home on Sunday evening next? I am most anxious to see you. I would have called this evening, but I am suffering from nervousness, the result of insomnia, and am obliged to remain at home. I have longed to see you all through the week. I have much to tell you. Do not think me forgetful in not coming before, because I shall never forget your kindness, and am conscious that I can never sufficiently express my thankfulness. Another letter ran. October 25th, 1894. Oscar, I want to go away and rest somewhere. I think in Cornwall for two weeks. I am determined to live a truly Christian life, and I accept poverty as part of my religion, but I must have health. I have so much to do for my mother. Sir Edward Clark. Now, Mr. Shelley, do you mean to tell the jury that having in your mind that this man had behaved disgracefully towards you, you wrote that letter of October 27, 1892? Yes, because after those few occurrences he treated me very well. He seemed really sorry for what he had done. He introduced you to his home? Yes, to his wife. I dined with them, and he seemed to take a real interest in me. You have met Lord Alfred Douglas? Yes, at his rooms at the Varsity. He was kind to you? Yes, he gave me a suit of clothes while I was there. And you found two letters in one of the pockets? Yes. Who from? From Mr. Wilde to Lord Alfred. How did they begin? One was addressed... Dear Alfred, and the other two, dear Bogey. Solicitor General. When did you first meet Lord Alfred? At Taylor's rooms in Little College Street. Then you visited him at the university? Yes. The Solicitor General then proceeded to ask the witness as to the terms upon which Wilde and Lord Alfred appeared to be, but this has been a prohibited topic from first to last, and was now successfully objected to. Charles Parker was called, and he repeated his evidence at great length, relating the most disgusting facts in a perfectly serene manner. He said that Wilde invariably began his campaign before arriving at the final nameless act with indecencies. He used to require the witness to do what is vulgarly known as 
tossing him off explained parker quite unabashed and he would often do the same to me he suggested two or three times that i should permit him to insert it in my mouth but i never allowed that he gave other details equally shocking a few other witnesses were examined and the rest of the day having been spent in the reading over of the evidence sir edward clarke submitted that in respect of certain counts of the indictment there was no evidence to go to the jury the solicitor general submitted that there was ample evidence to go to the jury who alone could decide as to whether or not it was worthy of belief the judge said he thought the point in respect to the savoy hotel incident was just on the line but he thought that the wiser and safer course was to allow the count in respect of this matter to go to the jury at the same time he felt justified if the occasion should arise in reserving the point for the court of appeal he was inclined to think it was a matter the responsibility of deciding which rested with the jury sir edward clark submitted next that there was no corroboration of the evidence of this witness the letters of shelley pointed to the inference that the latter might have been the victim of delusions and judging from his conduct in the witness box he appeared to have a peculiar sort of exaltation in and for himself the solicitor general maintained that shelley's evidence was corroborated as far as it could possibly be of course in a case of this kind there was an enormous difficulty in producing corroboration of eyewitnesses to the actual commission of the alleged act the judge held that shelley must be treated on the footing of an accomplice he adhered after a most careful consideration of the point to his former view that there was no corroboration of the nature required by the act to warrant conviction and therefore he felt justified in withdrawing that count from the jury sir edward clark made the same submission in the case of wood the solicitor general protested against any decision being given on these questions other than by a verdict of the jury in his opinion the case of the man wood could not be withheld from the jury he submitted that there was every element of strong corroboration of wood's story having regard especially to the strange and suspicious circumstances under which wilde and wood became acquainted sir edward clark quoted from the summing up of mr justice charles on the last trial relative to the directions which he gave the jury in the law respecting the corroboration of the evidence of an accomplice the judge was of opinion that the count affecting wood ought to go to the jury and he gave reasons why it ought not to be withheld sir edward clark after a private passage of arms with the solicitor general in respect to the need for corroborative evidence then began a brief but able appeal to the jury on behalf of his client after which wilde entered the witness box he formally denied the allegations against him sir frank lockwood in cross-examination now mr wilde i should like you to tell me where lord a douglas is now he is in paris at the hotel de demande how long has he been there three weeks have you been in communication with him certainly these charges are founded on sand our friendship is founded on a rock there has been no need to cancel our acquaintance was lord alfred in london at the time of the trial of the marquis of queensbury yes for about three weeks he went abroad at my request before the first trial on these counts came on may we take it that the two letters from you to him were samples of the kind you wrote him no they were exceptional letters born of two exceptional letters he sent to me it is possible i assure you to express poetry in prose i will read one of these prose poem letters do you think this line is decent addressed to a young man your rose-red lips which are made for the music of song and the madness of kissing it was like a sonnet of shakespeare it was a fantastic extravagant way of writing to a young man it does not seem to be a question of whether it is proper or not i used the word decent decent oh yes do you think you understand the word sir i do not see anything indecent in it it was an attempt to address in beautiful phraseology a young man who had much culture and charm 
How many times have you been in the College Street snuggery of the man Taylor? I do not think more than five or six times. Who did you meet there? Sidney Maver and Schwab. I cannot remember any others. I have not been there since I met Wood there. With regard to the Savoy Hotel witnesses? Their evidence is quite untrue. You deny that the bed linen was marked in the way described? I do not examine bed linen when I arise. I am not a housemaid. Were the stains there, sir? If they were, they were not caused in the way the prosecution most filthily suggests. Sir Edward Clark, after a slight breeze with the Solicitor General as to the right to the last word to the jury, then addressed that devoted band of men for the third time, and asked for the acquittal of his client on all the counts. Sir Frank Lockwood also addressed the jury, and the court then adjourned. Next day, the Solicitor General, resuming his speech on behalf of the Crown, dealt in details with the arguments of Sir E. Clark in defence of Wilde, and commented in strong terms on observations that he made respecting the lofty situation of Wilde, with his literary accomplishments, for the purpose of influencing the judgment of the young. He said that the jury ought to discard absolutely any such appeal, to apply simply their common sense to the testimony, and to form a conclusion on the evidence, which he submitted fully established the charges. He was commenting on another branch of the case, when Sir E. Clarke interposed on the ground that the learned Solicitor General was alluding to incidents connected with another trial. The Solicitor General maintained that he was strictly within his rights, and the judge held that the latter was entitled to make the comments objected to. My learned friend does not appear to have gained a great deal by his superfluity of interruption, remarked the Solicitor General suavely, and the court laughed loudly. The judge said that this sort of thing was most offensive to him. It was painful enough to have to try such a case and keep the scales of justice evenly balanced, without the court being pestered with meaningless laughter and applause. If such conduct were repeated, he would have the court cleared. The Solicitor General then criticised the answers given by Wilde to the charges, which explanations, he submitted, were not worthy of belief. The jury could not fail to put the interpretation on the conduct of the accused that he was a guilty man, and they ought to say so by their verdict. The judge, in summing up, referred to the difficulties of the case in some of its features. He regretted that if the conspiracy counts were unnecessary or cannot be established, they should have been placed in the indictment. The jury must not surrender their own independent judgment in dealing with the facts and ought to discard everything which was not relevant to the issue before them or did not assist their judgment. He did not desire to comment more than he could help about Lord Alfred Douglas or the Marquess of Queensbury. But the whole of this lamentable inquiry arose through the defendant's association with Lord A. Douglas. He did not think that the action of the Marquess of Queensbury in leaving the card at the defendant's club, whatever motives he had, was that of a gentleman. The jury were entitled to consider that these alleged acts happened some years ago. They ought to be the best judges as to the testimony of the witnesses and whether it was worthy of belief. The letters written by the accused to Lord A. Douglas were undoubtedly open to suspicion, and they had an important bearing on Wood's evidence. There was no corroboration of Wood as to the visit to Tite Street. And if his story had been true, he thought that some corroboration might have been obtained. Wood belonged to the vilest class of person which society was pestered with. And the jury ought not to believe his story unless satisfactorily corroborated. Their decision must turn on the character of the first introduction of Wilde to Wood. Did they believe that Wilde was actuated by charitable motives or by improper motives? The foreman of the jury, interposing at this stage, asked whether a warrant had been issued for the arrest of Lord Alfred Douglas, and if not, whether it was intended to issue one. The judge said he could not tell, but he thought not. It was a matter they could not now discuss. 
the granting of a warrant depended not upon the inferences to be drawn from the letters referred to in the case, but on the production of evidence of specific acts. There was a disadvantage in speculating on this question. They must deal with the evidence before them and with that alone. The foreman said, If we are to deduce from the letters, it applies to Lord Alfred Douglas equally as to the defendant. The judge, In regard to the question as to the absence of Lord A. Douglas, I warn you not to be influenced by any consideration of the kind. All that they knew was that Lord A. Douglas went to Paris shortly after the last trial and had remained there since. He felt sure that if the circumstances justified it, the necessary proceedings could be taken. His lordship dealt with each of the charges and the evidence in support of them, and he then, after thanking the jury for the patient manner in which they had attended to the case, left the issues in their hands. The jury retired to consider their verdict at half-past three o'clock, and at half-past five they returned into court. The Verdict Amidst breathless excitement, the foreman, in answer to the usual formal questions, announced the verdict. Guilty. Sir Edward Clarke. I apply, my lord, for a postponement of sentence. I must certainly refuse that request. I can only characterize the offences as the worst that have ever come under my notice. I have, however, no wish to add to the pain that must be felt by the defendants. I sentence both Wilde and Taylor to two years imprisonment with hard labour. The sentence was met with cries of shame, a scandalous verdict, unjust, by certain persons in court. The two prisoners appeared dazed, and Wilde especially seemed ready to faint as he was hurried out of sight to the cells. Thus perished by his own act a man who might have made a lasting mark in British literature, and secured for himself no mean place in the annals of his time. He forfeited, in the pursuit of forbidden pleasures, if pleasures they can be called, all and everything that made life dear. He entered upon his incarceration bankrupt in reputation, in friends, in pocket, and had not even left to him the poor shreds of his own self-esteem. He went into jail knowing that if he emerged alive, the darkness would swallow him up, and that his world, the spheres which had delighted to honour him, would know him no more. He had covered his name with infamy and sank his own celebrity in a slough of slime and filth. He would die to leave behind him what? The name of a man who was absolutely governed by his own vices and to whom no act of immorality was too foul or horrible. Oscar Wilde emerged from prison in every way a broken man, the wonderful descriptive force of the Ballad of Reading Jail, the perfect torturing self-analysis of De Profundis, speak eloquently of powers unimpaired. But they were the swan songs of a once great mind. All his abilities had fled. He seemed unable to concentrate his mind upon anything. He took up certain subjects, played with them, and wearied of them in a day. French authors did not ostracise the erratic English genius when he hid himself amongst them, and they honestly endeavoured to find him employment. But his faculties had been blunted by the horrors of prison life. His epigrams had lost their edge. His aphorisms were trite and aimless. He abandoned every subject he took up in despair. His mind died before his body. He suffered from a complete mental atrophy. A nightingale cannot sing in a cage. A genius cannot flourish in a prison. He died in two years and is now the merest memory. Let us remember this of him. If he sinned much, he suffered much. Peace to his ashes. End of section 7. End of the trial of Oscar Wilde by Anonymous.